Hi, friend. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Tasha. So maybe just to start, you and I just did 10 minutes of eye gazing, which is your newest experiment. And I wonder if you could tell me what that is, what we just did, why you're doing it, and what your experience of doing it with me was. So basically, we just looked at each other's eyes for 10 minutes silently. Um, it's a little trickier with Zoom because it's not direct eye contact, but if you get your eyes close to the camera, it's, you know, it has a very similar feeling to being in person. And I've been doing it with, I think you're my like 50 second person, maybe. Um, I, I decided to do it with 100 people kind of, you know, Visa on Twitter has this thing about doing things a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And I did it with my wife and my dad, and it was really powerful and interesting. And I was like, dang it, I wish I had more people I knew that would be willing to do this. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, um, I could try it on Zoom. So, mm -hmm. and 50 people have signed up and done it, <laughs> which is amazing. Uh -huh. And I guess the experience of doing it with you is just, like every time is different. It's just like, a lot of times, like I, I'm very aware of the person, but then, you know, my own thoughts for, for whatever was happening just kind of come in and go out and it's very, uh, it's very meditative. Um, and a lot of people share that experience. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing that happened with you that I've noticed before, but I'll be looking at your eye and then your face will start morphing and stuff and like, like changing like shape and like, it's, it's very interesting, these different like hallucinations. Um, but, but I guess with you, I, yeah, I, I felt, uh, I mean, there was like a certain sadness, a certain pain, a certain gentleness that came, came across. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just, it felt, I, I just, I feel so grateful that everyone and including you are willing just to sit there with me, do this hmm. experiment with me. Hmm. And I have no idea where it's going to go or anything, but hmm. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, nice to do that. I've done that sort of thing before, but it was nice to do with you. And uh, I certainly, yeah, I felt very immersed in my own experience. There were some background feelings of sadness and grief present before this call. And uh, those sort of, with the silence, like that just came to the forefront. And so uh, it felt very immersed in my own experience and like cried a few times. and. Uh, just because that's 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 what needed to happen, but it also feels like, um, I mean, obviously we're just getting started with the conversation, but like that that's going to be a good ground for this conversation of like connection and presence and that sort of thing. So um, I really appreciate that that space being opened up. Yeah, and like I was telling you before, my one one of my challenges I'm going to be doing during this podcast is basically being comfortable with more silence mm. um, instead of what I sometimes do, which is I start talking while I'm still thinking, um, and I I never really like the effect of that. So mm. Mm -hmm. so that will be fun to it's fun to start off with silence, ten minutes of silence. <laughs> yes, yes. So listeners, if there's even more silence than usual, you'll know why because that's something yeah. That is bringing to this conversation which i think <laughs> so so just let your let your mind reflect on where it's at you know, and <laughs> let, let it become a little uh, mini meditation yes yes there, there's no awkward pauses right mm -hmm. there's 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 here, here we go here's a i'll paraphrase bob ross there's no awkward pauses there's only surprise meditations mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. unexpected meditations <laughs> There you go. There's no awkward pauses. There's only unexpected meditations. Mm. Or well something said. like that. Well said, Nat Ross, Bob Sharp. Bob Sharp. Oh, yeah. That's got a that's kind of got a catchy ring to it. Yeah. Hmm.
<laughs> I don't think you actually. There's one I asked you. I did the thing. I do this sometimes where I ask multiple questions at once. I think you answered two of them, but not the middle. Oh one, no! Which is uh, you sort of, sort of implied it, but I, I would be curious to dive more. Which is why would you embark on doing a hundred Zoom eye contact sessions? Like, what what is the interest or value for you in that? Not that there shouldn't be, but I'm curious how you would describe that. Well, curious, that's, that's a good, that's one word. Um, but I think it, it kind of ties into a lot of the challenges I've done in that it's basically kind of leaning into the sphere I have of other people. Mm. Mm. And I did this session with this guy recently. He does like kind of somatic healing and stuff or IFS stuff. But one of the things that came up during that was this feeling of shame that was in my face. Mm. And like, we talked to my face and asked it, like, why are you feeling shame? And, and the response that came from my face was basically like, I'm afraid they will see me mm. or I'm afraid I will be seen. And they will, and then it's like, well, what are you afraid they'll see? And then mm. The response was my sin, mm. my sin, mm. my, the darkness or the, mm. and I think I've always been terrified of letting people look into my eyes because I just feel like they'll see through my mask and that'll be the end. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's probably one reason. It's just like, and so far that hasn't happened yet. Like no, nobody's like freaked out or something. Nobody has seen some, you know, I mean, it's like, so I think that that's like all the, all these challenges I've done. It's just like, I have these fears and then this part of my mind is like, well, that's your fear. Why don't you see what actually happens? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I see, and then I do it. And then this terrible thing I was afraid of doesn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I think doing it like multiple times just helps with that, like kind of just get that soaked in, right? Because like I did it with my wife and even my dad it was like, you know, like someone who knew me and loved me and, you know, but like doing it with like 50 different strangers and having these pretty profound experiences. Um, most of it's just normal. I mean, I think that's, that's one interesting thing from this whole uh, experiment is most of it just feels really normal. Like after the first few seconds of awkwardness and, you know, some people will like start crack like laughing, like they, they just can't, you know, like it's just like so awkward. Hmm. Um, but then even that, like, I mean, I'll start laughing too, cause it's contagious and then we'll just laugh. And then because we're doing it for 10 minutes, that just subsides naturally and goes back into this very calm, just normal experience. Hmm. Hmm. Is that fear of being seen present now going into this conversation? Uh, de yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Well, that, that's, that's one reason I was interested in doing it too. <laughs> uh -huh. It's like, yes. it's another way of leaning into that fear and, and uh, seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I was even joking with you at the beginning, like I was like, talking about you know, being, being a little sexier or like i was like i was finding a way of like even kind of like leaning into it more and being like like, like what's something that would be like a little uncomfortable to wear you know like mm. what's something that would kind of get, get the most out of this experience right i mean it's just like i don't i don't feel like i have a huge message i want to share with anyone i don't feel like i don't have anything to sell i don't have any like it really is like the game I'm playing apart from just like talking to you and like, you know, talking with people, making friends and hanging out and vibing. It really is like this, this game I'm playing with myself of just like, I don't know, just, just self-confidence, self-love. Mm -hmm. Like what's the worst that could happen? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you, as you were sharing that this part of the appeal of the eye gazing is like working through this fear of being seen, uh, <clears throat> I realized slash remembered that part of my intention with these podcast conversations is to like really see who someone is like as best mm. as I can. Oh uh, no. <laughs> my job is to uh, see you. Uh, but my job is also, uh, uh, no, no, no. But my job is also to love you, which I already do. I love you a lot and have been inspired mm. by you and uh, appreciate mm. you. And that's part of why I want to see you so I can share who you are with the world, because I think the world needs that both from you and everyone that I have on the podcast, you know, uh, there's something that I want to show to the world. I want to see them and love them and make that visible to the world, what I see and what I love. Um, so that's good news and bad news. I suppose bad news because hopefully you get seen. <laughs> yeah. Good news because it's going to be fine and be good for the world. Yeah. But I, I guess, I mean, that, that would be my, that, that's my secret desire, like deep down, right? Is, mm. is that I would be seen and that basically there wouldn't be anything to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess that that's the, so, I mean, there you go. Like, so it really is. And that, that's the thing, like all these challenges I've done, it's like, they've always been, or if, most of them have been like things that I was like actually interested in doing or at least like directionally like in mm -hmm. toward like that would enable me to do more of the things I wanted to do yes um and it wasn't just like I wasn't just picking complete arbitrary fears it was like it really was like like let's let's open up my ability to do more of what I actually want mm -hmm. Um, and just and recognizing that that fear was pr pretty much the only thing holding me back. <laughs> like, that's pretty embarrassing, or to admit, like after years of not doing something mm. and having really rational reasons and excuses for why you're you're not doing something, mm. it's 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 embarrassing to admit that it it was fear. Mm. It was it was a, it was it was fear, so. And painful. It's painful to admit. It's painful to admit when it's something that, yeah, it's just, it's just easier to live like just believing that someone else is controlling your life or out things outside your control, and you know you, you don't have. A, I don't know. It's a, it, I don't. Know. Yeah, why don't you ask me something else? I'm starting to ramble. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it'd be good to ask the question that I ask everybody towards the beginning, at the beginning, which is start at the beginning, which is uh, who are you? What's your life story? What would you like to share with us about your background, your history, in whatever detail you'd like, you know, could be long, could be short, uh, whatever you'd like to share about your background, I would love to hear and listen to. Well, number one, I, I don't know who I am. And I think that that's one of the most interesting questions in the world. And I think pretty much everyone is trying to solve that question, no matter what they're studying and learning. Hmm. Um, you even like astrophysicists, um, biologists, chemists, engineers, artists. Um, but basically I was born in a community that was started in the 1970s in Portland, Oregon, basically on a college campus. It was a bunch of like college students that were born again Christians. This was kind of in the tail end of the hippie movement. And my mom and her, my mom and her dad were really interested in it. And she kind of pushed him to start this little group of people. It was started out just like a bunch of like people living in houses, kind of like co-housing and um, and then eventually evolved into actually like sharing income, 
like they were pooling their resources together. And then eventually my mom and dad basically took over and then they decided to become Catholic, which was really interesting because before that they were just like charismatic kind of non-denominational. And so that was when I was two years old. And so, yeah, I mean, they, there was about 30 people or so it wasn't, it was never really big and they never really encouraged people to join. Um, they, they, they tried very hard not to make it like a cult. Um, so it really had the feeling growing up of just like a really big family. Like there was like other kids there that were like my brothers and sisters. Um, but there was a bunch of like single people, um, too. So I had like, it was felt like ants and I felt like a tribe. I felt like I, I grew up in a little tribe. And it was really interesting to have that experience. Um, I'm really grateful for it. Um, but uh, then when I was about 20, or actually I was about 19, and <clears throat> a young woman joined the group and really liked it. And we ended up making a movie together. Like I knew I'd gone to film school and I'd always like making movies and she wanted to make a movie. So we made a movie with our friends and in the community there. Um, and we ended up falling in love. We got married. We had our first kid. And then we were feeling the need for some more freedom. Uh, so we left and I had no idea what to do. So I was just like, we were super poor. I had never really planned on making, like having a career or doing anything on my own. So that was really hard. <clears throat> and we were also pregnant with our second kid when we left. Um, so anyways, now we have four kids. Um, for a while, like I did sales for a while. Then I was like an antique dealer full-time, like buying and selling like junk I'd find in barns and then I would sell it on eBay. And we did that, we didn't make very much money. We were on food stamps. Um, and that was in all of North Dakota where I grew up and where we got married. And then we moved to North Carolina to escape the terrible winters. And my whole life basically fell apart. We ran out of our savings, moved back in with my in-laws with four kids. Uh, um, and then I learned how to do, uh, I went to a boot camp. I learned how to do coding was able to move my family out uh, to join me in Atlanta. So that was, that probably saved my life. Um, I was getting so, so depressed and my anxiety, I was having anxiety attacks all the time. And so, yeah, so yeah, that's basically my entire life story. And now I'm currently, my wife learned to code too. So she was able to, to get a, really good paying job i was able to quit my job and just be with our kids so now i basically am the the full-time dad and we spent all of last year driving around the country in an rv so that was like a lifelong dream of my wife so that was really fun and then we bought a house at the beginning of this year that's our first house so we've been married 10 years we have four kids and we just bought a house mm -hmm. there you go my story mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, friend. And uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the community that you grew up in and, and what uh, that was like to grow up in that and, and what maybe what you took away or what values you feel were instilled in you that you maybe still hold. I don't know, anything you'd like to share in that direction. <clears throat> sure, yeah. So. Basically, I, I had a very strong sense of belonging and identity. Um, a sense of like being kind of in the center of the universe, like all the different projects and things that the community were trying to org org orchestrate and different conferences and things they put on. It was, it was very exciting from that perspective. Um, it felt like we were living this radical you know, really interesting lifestyle. 
on the other hand, it also, I also felt really weird, like going out to like the mall or something. And, you know, we'd wear suspenders and like, we just, we look kind of weird and then the women would be wearing dresses and head coverings. So there was definitely a, a sense of like being kind of abnormal. Um, but for the most part, like I, I yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, it was very structured. Like the, we, we all got schedules, like where basically every half hour was broken out into like different, you know, tasks, or, I mean, there was like some free time, but very structured. Uh, we were, they homeschooled us. So my parents didn't teach me, but cause like there was like other, like, uh, you know, grownups that were at the community that were, that taught different classes. And I think in terms of like the, probably one of the biggest lessons I got was basically honesty above everything else. And I think that's probably partly because the way the community survived, they've been going for 50 years now which is crazy. Um, like most intentional communities do not last 50 years. Most relationships don't last 50 years. So here you have like, you know, 20, 30, about 20 people now, I guess. And a lot of them have been together for 50 years. Um, and the only way they really did that, I think was through like very honest communication and just, just prioritizing that above pretty much anything. So, so like the one for unforgivable sin that I felt growing up was basically dishonesty and I, I would break the rules. I would do different things. I'd get in trouble, but I'd almost always confess. I'd almost always like make up, you know, like bring it to the light because I knew like that, that was the one thing that would destroy the group or at least like give my parents disapproval. <clears throat> so, Yeah. It's uh, it's one of those things like I like when we were thinking of leaving, like I, I just I couldn't even imagine living outside really, um, but then once I got out, then I was I started appreciating the freedom and the being able to like set more of my own schedule or dress how I wanted to, um, and most importantly, think what I wanted to. So, I, I that would like. Like I'm not Catholic anymore. I'm not even, I'm not Christian. I'm not religious. I've basically, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've basically, I mean, pursued a very different path, but in a way that has kept open the relationships with my parents, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> so, so, so like a couple of years after I left when I was kind of like, you know, realizing that I didn't really believe anymore and I didn't want to practice my faith. And I, I, I brought it up with my wife. I brought it up with my dad. I basically said like, Hey guys, how, you know, how would you feel if I stopped being a Catholic? Like I, I was very open about it because once again, I knew that this, I valued it. I valued relationship. I valued these people who love me. And I was, I was able to find a way to kind of like go on, go down my own path while maintaining that. And I guess I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm very proud of, of being able to do that and, and grateful. I did that instead of just like cutting it off and saying they're bad, they're evil. And I found something better. And I don't really feel that way at all. Like I, I see what they have and I'm like, I, I am never going to experience what they have. Like I, I know what it's like to have community. I know what it's like to belong and I know what the cost is required. And I don't know. No, I mean, I, so it's, I see it. It's a, it's a very beautiful thing. It's a very good thing, but, but I'm not willing to pay that price anymore. What's the price? Uh, price is freedom. Hmm. Freedom, especially just freedom of, of uh, what you believe. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to have a group of people that stick together for a long time, they, they're going to have to willingly and knowingly sacrifice their own individual little desires and things and for, the, for the sake of the, the, you know, the group.
which like once again like it's fine like if they're if they're happy doing that that's great you know and it's possible that sacrificing yourself for a larger cause and group is pro- the best way to happiness i mean that's it seems like there's a lot of happy people that do that mm-hmm. so i don't know no I, I i guess it's one of those questions where it's just like i don't i don't really know why you know i mean i don't know how i feel about i mean i i it depends on the day or it depends on the mood um but uh but yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely grateful for the experience because it was like unique and different. And I think it gives me a very different take on things than like most, you know, people that were, went to public school and, you know, just had a normal, more normal childhood. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's a, uh, but I, I guess I kind of have my own community now. I mean, I have, you know, like four kids and a wife and it's definitely a lot more community than a lot of people have. Mm-hmm. What makes you unwilling to pay that price now? The price of community, the price of freedom. Um, <laughs> what my family just got back. Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is funny. This is this doesn't sound very good, but but the answer that's coming to me is like is that I am. Mm-hmm. I am willing to pay it. And the interesting thing, like, like, and that's like, even the story of how I left commu- my community, it was my wife who was feeling the need for more freedom. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, just the structure of the community and the way the, the focus of the community was kind of shifting and, but like little things like, like they wanted us to use cloth diapers instead of, you know, other, you know, cloth diaper or uh, paper diapers and just like little things where it kind of made it hard. Um, and, and yeah, she was feeling the need. She was feeling the need for, for more agency, more, more say in how she, we raised the kids. And, and yeah, if, 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 if I hadn't married her, like I would still be there. Hmm. Hmm. Like I, I would, I, I wouldn't necessarily be happy but I would, I would probably still be there. Um, still believing what I believed before. So, so that's the question. So, I mean, I mean, I obviously, I basically prioritized my relationship with my wife over my relationship with the community, which is interesting. Um, that, I mean, that wouldn't necessarily, I mean, that could have been a deal breaker in a certain sense. Um, even though like the community thought that they were kind of, they were like, yeah, you know, you guys, you know, go live on your own for a little bit. You know, that might be a good experience for you and you're, you're welcome to come back. And, you know, so it wasn't even like, I was basically the only one like, this is a terrible idea. What are, what are you guys talking about? I don't, I don't know how to make money. What the heck? That's what you guys are for. That's what, like, what the heck? Um, so yeah, like in a certain sense, like, yeah, I'm, I basically, I, I am, I am willing to pay the price. I, I guess, I guess that's the, that's the answer. Is that that I'm still with the community that I, I basically prioritized over my parents and their community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So actually, there you go. I, 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 it's uh, there you go. Mm-hmm. But I'm basically only willing to pay that price with people that aren't going to leave me. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that was one of the most painful things in the community when is when people left. Like that, that it just it just hurt so bad. Like we'd have people stay with us for years and years, and then for whatever reason they would leave. And like as a kid growing up there, it was like uh, it was so painful. Mm-hmm. It just mm-hmm. felt me feel so helpless and just like sad. And like why are they leaving? And what's don't they want to stay? Don't they want to be with us? Don't they want to? So so yeah, it's, I guess that's what I feel with my with Martha. It's just like she committed her to me 
Hmm. For, for life. No, nobody else has done that. Hmm. E- even my kids will eventually leave me. Hmm. But it's like Martha is committed to me for life and I committed to her. So to me, it's. Yeah, I mean, we're, there's still this constant like negotiation or like, you know, co- conversation we've been having for 10 years over like what what kind of freedom. You know, how, how can we, how can we individually have enough freedom to, to be happy, but there's never, I mean, it's always been in the context of being married. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's good. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I guess that's the answer is that I actually am willing to pay the price. <laughs> just, just not in the, the context I was in before. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I'm having two questions come to mind about your marriage and I'll leave you yeah. to decide how you want to answer them. But um, first is about when you met Martha and, you know, I've met Martha uh, in person. She's lovely. And I've also been in love and know what it's like to be in love. And so in a certain way, it makes a lot of sense to me that you would leave the community for your marriage and um, she's wonderful. And that makes total sense. Uh, the question I'm asking is like, yeah, about her and what, qualities she has in herself and like in relationship with you that came into your life through meeting her that made you uh yeah like fall in love with her and want to be married to her and want to leave this community that was so precious to you for her um like what 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 about Mm -hmm. her character did you see that was uh made you love her and commit yourself to her yeah who who is she (laughs) That's a great question. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to go uh, ask her to close the door. I'll be right back. Hmm. So I met her after I went, I went to film school when I was 18 and it was just like an unaccredited little academy thing. Um, and I came back when I was 19 and my mom, they were doing some outreach at this local university. And she asked me to give a talk on filmmaking, like a series. And I was just like, I don't want to, it just, it sounded so ridiculous for me, like 19 years old to be giving a talk at a university, you know, I I felt so underqualified and just so humiliating, but I had the kind of relationship with my mom that I would tend just to, like, it was her idea to go to this film school. Um, So I I just tended to do what she wanted. Um, And it's Mother's Day. Mm. Um, She, uh, so I did it. And after the first class, this, this girl came up to me and she was like geeking out about like, I was talking about storytelling and like the, the principle mm-hmm. the hero's journey. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was geeking out to me about the hero's journey and be like, Oh man. <laughs> and that was kind of fun. I was like, Oh wow. Hey, this isn't too bad. <laughs> like, and then, and then she later wrote a whole long email to me about like, she'd done this whole thesis on this hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that was, Mar- it was Martha. Yeah. Um, and then it just over the next few months or whatever, she would kind of relate to the community and, was involved in different activities and stuff. And then she ended up staying the summer with us. Um, and like, so we would just, there, there was probably about like maybe six different like single people, like young people that would just like kind of hang out in the evenings around campfires. And like, we didn't have TV or movies or like we had movies like once or twice a week, but no TV, no radio. So a lot of board games, a lot of card games, a lot of walks and, so it's a great way to kind of just start, you know, getting to know someone. And then, and then, like I said, she wanted to make a movie. And by that time I was like so burned out by making movies because it was no fun anymore. Like it was fun when I was a kid and I was doing it with my friends, but now I had learned the right way to make a movie. And I was just reading Impro by uh, whatever that guy's name is. And he, he said the exact same thing. He said like, as soon as I learned how things should be done, it just, all my talent just drained away and my it just became not fun anymore and so she she wanted to make a movie because you know she loves storytelling and 
and I was just like, oh my gosh, just like it was just like this huge, like it's like whatever we do is going to be like this so pathetic and so like low quality, and she's going to be so disappointed. I just got to spare her this pain. I just, I just, this is so embarrassing. But she was very persistent, and and then I was finally like, okay, like you know what? I don't even want to think about the story. But it's like if if you're willing to do the story, like I'll I'll direct it, like I'll make it happen. Because like to me, the story was the most important thing. So it was the most high stake thing, right? So like the idea of coming up with a, a good story was just petrifying. Mm. So so I, I let her handle that part, and then wake. So she ended up writing this really funny screenplay, and it was basically the the terrible tick, or it was called the terrible tickle monster. Mm. And it was a cross between Beowulf and Fiddler on the Roof. And it had like songs from like, yeah, it had songs from Fiddler on the Roof. It had songs from Mary Poppins. And it was, it was, it was really weird. And, but like we, we, we got all our friends to make costumes and it was just, it was great. And she thought it was amazing. Like it was like, it turned out to be this amazing experience for her. <clears throat> and I had, and she actually, her enthusiasm and her like uncriticalness and her just like willingness to look foolish and just try stuff gave me so much permission that like I actually had fun. Like I mm. actually had fun again, making movies. Mm. And then of course, during like late night editing sessions, like sitting there together and like, you know, think it started getting a little, uh, you know, other things started, you know, happening <laughs> creative, the creative juices. Right. Uh -huh. Um, but it was really weird, like in community. I mean, it's like I still like I was I was not gonna do anything about it. Like I, I'd had crushes. I'd kind of had this one relationship with this girl for like six years, kind of off and on. Mm. But like, it was always it was so weird. Like, like we never even held hands. Like, mm. like I never t touched her. Mm. Like <laughs> it, it was it was like a. I mean, yeah, that was crazy. Um, so so like with Martha though, like she was just so comfortable with herself and in, in a way that I was not. Mm. um that eventually so eventually i found out like i think i shared it with my dad it was, it was hilarious how it worked out like i think i shared like i kind of, i liked her with my dad and then she, she he had she had been talking to someone else in the community like one of her mentors and he he, he, he told me like well nat you know she actually likes you mm. and i was just blown away like i, I couldn't even imagine that she had actually like, she liked me like mm. it was just like what <laughs> Um, so there was basically kind of this arranged like courtship thing mm. where we just, we were still living together. Like everyone was living together in the same place. Um, but like, we, we would like sit together at meals and then we would start having like little kind of dates. And like one of my first dates, we, we went on a walk and I, I was so nervous. Like I threw up behind a tree. Mm. Like I was, it was just terrifying to me. Like, mm. and then of course that made it even more embarrassing. Oh. Uh, but that's the thing with her though. It's like, so like you're going back to the point, like what, what was different about her? It's like, I felt like she was one of the first people in my life that I was, I felt was interested in who I was. Hmm. She wasn't just interested in the community. She wasn't just interested in God. She wasn't just interested in, you know, whatever, like she was interested in me. And that was like a superpower um and going back to like the beginning of this like she was one of the first people that i remember in my life being comfortable looking at her eyes mm. for like long periods of time mm. like there was no awkwardness like like i had done dancing and stuff like swing dancing and ballroom dancing before and i had never i would never look at the girl mm. like i would never look at her mm. but when i looked at her there was just no, there was just no there was no judgment there was no it was the opposite. It was like, she was actually, she was just, she was encouraging me. Like she, it was infectious. Like it was just an infectious enthusiasm. Mm. So, so yeah, I'm, there really was no question. Like, like once it became clear that like she, she was interested in leaving and like, I mean, I was going to go with her. Like, mm. like she made me feel a way that, that, yeah, I mean, so yeah, on an individual level, but then of course sexually too. I mean, just like meeting these needs in a way that like the community had not been able to meet. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we I, I was married uh like two months after my twenty first birthday. Mm -hmm. About a couple of years after you met her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, barely. Yeah, mm -hmm. barely like two years after I met her. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, because back back then too, like you know, like like I, like I said, I was very conservative. You know, so it's like if you have feelings for somebody, like there's it's pretty much. I mean, that's there, there's one path. Mm-hmm. You, you get married. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. So. So yeah, yeah. I have I have all sorts of like very you know complicated feelings about like the, that whole thing and like the you know like would I've done it differently? Should I, you know was it was I too young? I mean, all these different things. And it's just like I, I'm not sure. I don't think it's really helpful to do that. Mm-hmm. But but I, it's it's always funny like like on Twitter when people are you know the dating discourse discourse is happening or the <laughs> you know it's just like. Or, or people are always like, oh, wow, you've been married for 10 years, dad. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's so, so cool. And, and it's just like, I, I have nothing to share. Like I have nothing, like uh, my situation was so bizarre. It was so weird. You know, how it happened was so crazy. Like that's, that's another reason like, I, I like never talk about like my marriage, hmm. like online and stuff. It's just, <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's, it was like, I was married, like, in a completely different culture or like a hundred years ago, or like, it was just like, it was, just, it was, it was not at all what the normal experiences. Hmm. So. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. What, what is it? How does that make you feel? Oh, it's sweet to start. I mean, uh, it's <laughs> sweet to hear about the story of how you met her and falling in love with her. Yeah. It connects some dots for me about, you know, as I say, I've met her and I know you and, uh, make sense of your relationship and it, it's it's beautiful and I, I feel grateful that you shared it with me and grateful that you two are together and she exists and that you exist I don't know, feel love for both of you yeah yeah Great. um yeah the other question that came about your marriage and um yeah again I'll leave you to decide how you want to answer this but if at all, but um, let me think how to ask it as well. Take some of this precious silence to decide how to ask this question. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Yeah, you said earlier that part of the reason you left to be with her was that she was committed to you in a way that, you know, people had left the community and that was painful and you knew she wouldn't leave you and that you wouldn't leave her. Uh, Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. So, and I'd, I'd note as well that you said this with like a tone of conviction like you believed it and i believed you you know i was like yes this is this is true uh this is a truth that you're sharing uh, which feels um precious and uh yeah and i'll note that my question is coming from my heart which means i really care about this question and it feels vulnerable to me to ask this question and and um impactful to me to ask this question and to hear what you're about to say, um, however you answer. Uh, that, that's all I'll say about that. This is, this, this is a felt question. You know, some questions are like, right. oh, this is interesting intellectually. And some mm, are like, right. okay, I'm asking a vulnerable question that will be a vehicle for some wisdom that I need. <laughs> yes. Maybe how, how's the, um... Oh, you just being yourself will be the perfect okay, answer. Good. <laughs> you can't, you cannot fail. I wrote this tweet recently. Um, there's a way in which someone asking a vulnerable question is evidence that you already have the answer. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, uh, I love it. So I really believe that you have this answer <clears throat> and you don't need to be some special person to answer. You just need to be, you, <laughs> you know, uh, so that's how I see it. I don't know. Uh, you can see it differently, but that's how I see it. But uh, let's see. The question is something like, I mean, you, you said earlier in the podcast, you know, most relationships don't last that long. Most communities don't last that long, right? 
that's that's just a fact, right? Like these days, most relationships don't. So, and yet you had this kind of tone of conviction, like she won't leave me and I won't leave her. That's just how it is. That's the commitment we made to each other, you know? And so I'm kind of like juxtaposing those things. And I'm like, how do you know that? How do you know she won't leave you? How do you know you won't leave her? I believe you, but how do you know that? Mm. I guess the thing, the thing that comes to me is just we've never lied. She's never lied to me. Like every everything she has said has it's been as best she knew the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to do the same for her. Mm. So she said she wasn't going to leave me. I said I wasn't going to leave her. And you've never lied to each other. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. I, I mean, it's like I, I, how can I, I can't say for certain. I mean, there's no. I mean, who knows what could happen? But mm -hmm. but ba I guess just based on uh, I guess twelve years now, mm -hmm. based on twelve years of uh, past history, when we have said something, we have we have done it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful. How does it feel to say that to me? feel it feels like i have something that's it's beautiful it's just it's like a it's just like a it's a i, I guess i just i, I mean it's yeah it's just, it feels like it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. it's a beautiful like rare precious kind of thing that i for whatever reason like and like i, can, I don't even take credit for i mean it's not like, like i said like i, I don't want to like set myself up as like this model relationship or something like i think it's part i think most of it is just, <laughs> i mean based on who she was you know, her personality based on how I was raised, you know, like how I was like brought up in this very, you know, this hyper communication, hyper honesty kind of mindset. Like it's just, it's been working out mm -hmm. and it's just like, it's, it's not even any, I mean, it's not judgment on anyone else. It's not, it's just, she, here, here's another one. Like, like basically, basically like my first relationship I had, like the first girl I was really in love with, like I was basically, I, I just I basically just wanted to have sex with her. Like, <laughs> I mean, after, I mean, it was, I was definitely like, there was things I really liked about her, but I had this one or yeah, it was just, I, I had this feeling of just like this one time I was imagining like getting married to her and like finally, you know, you know having sex with her and, and then just sitting there being like, Oh crap. Now what, but you mean, you mean I have to like spend the rest of my life with this woman? Like, mm -hmm. Oh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. And it was, so, it was so sh like shocking to me to like actually admit that I didn't really like being around this person. Mm. Um, so that was another thing with Martha that like uh, came up pretty early on when we were recording was I could imagine us being like 80 years old, mm -hmm. sitting together, watching a movie and enjoying each other. Mm -hmm. Like actually and like just hanging out. Mm -hmm. And like, so, so I guess that's the other thing. It's just like, I can imagine it. I can imagine it happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, knowing me, knowing her, it just it seems seems likely that that we'll be together mm -hmm. until one of us dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I say, I believe you when you say it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks wow. for answering. I feel um, yeah. a sad gratitude coming up with you answering that. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's wisdom that I needed here. So thank you. Uh, Good. Uh, so fast forwarding a little bit, uh, you left the community with Martha, and then that was that was a change for you. Uh, <laughs> leaving the community, being out in the world, first kid, you know, second one on the way. Uh, what kinds of lessons did you need to learn in those years after you transitioned out of the community? 
how did you have to grow? Hmm. I said, get out of my brain. Just had to get out of my brain. I just, I had all these ideals and like I, this image of myself and these things I valued myself for. And I was just ripped away, just absolutely ripped away. Like my, my sense of identity, my sense of worth, just absolutely destroyed. Um, like, I, I guess I, I kind of had this like fantasy, like, well, someday, like, you know, especially after film school, like someday I might become a, a famous director. Like that, that, that might be acceptable. Like mm. if, if I had to get a job, like being a famous film director, that doesn't sound too bad. Mm. Like maybe I'll just do, I'll, I could do that. You know, and then it basically <laughs> be ripped out. Uh, we, 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 found, we found a, a friend of the community um, their daughter had actually married my cousin. They were they had been in community. He had a construction business and uh, an ab a basement par apartment. So so we moved in there, and I was working for him and absolutely failing. Like mm -hmm. I did not know enough. Like I did not know enough of what I was being asked to do. Like I was just making a mess of things. Um, mm -hmm. And. Yeah, I kind of asked him if I could make some like videos, like can I do like some ads or something? Like, and he just he had no interest, no desire, no need. But like that would have been that would have felt like I was like fulfilling my potential, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Um, and then I remember this what one, one <laughs> like that was the first time I had money. It's like the first month I was getting a paycheck. And I was like, oh my gosh, I finally have my own money. I could do stuff with it. I don't have to, it's not just going disappearing into the the vast, you know, communal pot. Um and so I was, I started buying some stuff on eBay for myself and, and then like Martha like came to me and she's like, Nat, like you just spent the money that we needed for, you know, food or we, for rent here. Like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and it was just like this sinking, like shame, just uh, depression of just like, oh, right. Yeah. We're poor. We're poor. We're just, we're incredibly poor. Like, this is, this is terrible. I'm not a famous film director. <laughs> and, and then and the worst, I got fired. Like, so the guy, the guy that we were living with, he fired me uh -huh. and we just kept living in his basement. <laughs> and and, and the, we were in this tiny little town in North Dakota. Like there's barely any place to work, but there was a job like selling frozen food, um, uh -huh. Schwann's. Uh -huh. So you basically drive around in this truck and you go to these customers out in the middle of nowhere and you, you give, you know, you had frozen fish sticks or ice cream or whatever. And, and Martha was looking at that. She's like, Nat, you can't do that. Like, you'd have to talk to people. You'd have to like, talk, like door to door sales. Like, what are you, what? And I, and I was, but I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? Uh, I might be able, like, it, it was all, it was, a, there was a little bit of me that was like curious. Like, I wonder if I could do it. Mm. Um, so like when I was being trained though, like it, it was just, it was terrible. Like it was, it was like, it was a nightmare, like meeting these people and trying to sell, you know, sell to them. And I didn't even know what I was selling. And, and, but one of, one of the guys training me, he pulled me aside and he's like, Hey, Nat, you know, I, I used to be very introverted too. And like, I understand, you know, but you're looking down at the ground, you're not looking at the strength, you're not, not looking at the customers, you're not, you're just mumbling. And he gave me this piece of advice that really stuck with me. And he said, what I do, or what I do when I was learning is like, I would see these people, these strangers as old friends I hadn't met yet. Mm. And, and that attitude like basically shifting my model from stranger danger, mm. you know, like, Oh, these scary people to like, Oh, an old friend mm. or just like, just. And so I basically started acting that way and they, I, I would look at them and they would smile at me. Mm. Like they would, they would be friendly. They would like, I mean, they would reciprocate, but, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of those times, like I would go out there like driving for like 14 hours every day. Mm and come home so exhausted so just emotionally worn out from like interacting with people like every i mean i would just curl up in a fetal position on the couch and sometimes i'd watch a movie with martha um 
or like watch a TV show and then just go to bed and do it again. Uh-huh. And the whole time though, like you, apart from all the, like the pain of it and stuff. Oh, and eventually the, the family, their son was moving back in with them. So they kicked us out of the basement. So, <laughs> oh, so, the, so then we had to go out and get our own apartment, which was a ton of money. And, oh my gosh. Oh, so embarrassing. Just so, so humiliating. Hmm. And I was just, I just kept, I'd be driving out there in my stupid little, like, like Schwann's uniform and like, like, and I'd be thinking like, oh my gosh, if like, I never posted on Facebook, I never talked about it. Cause I, I could just imagine like my, my classmates at the film school, just shaking their head, mm. just, oh, poor Nat. He's, mm. he's not a famous film director. He's, he's not living to his full potential. Mm. He's just, he's selling, what, what is he doing? Selling pizzas? Like mm. what? Like I, I was, I was so embarrassed. And at the, at the, but now looking back on it, I'm like, there I was for like the first time, like actually like making an income and like taking care of myself and trying to provide for like my wife and family. And like, there's a million reasons why I could be really proud of myself. Mm-hmm. But yeah. in the moment, like I could not see any of that. And I was just humiliated. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was because it, but the image of myself that I had was so far off from the image that I was actually living out, or at least that I saw. Um, mm-hmm. So, so going back to your question, it's like, that was the, one of the big, big lesson. Number one was like interacting with, with strangers and like actually learning how to actually like be comfortable with people um, that I didn't already know. And number two was just like, just the brutal, like getting kicked out of like this fantasy that I was living about who I was and finding, like just being kicked out into like the real world, with real money, with a budget, with, a, with, two kids with a wife who, who, who needed me to keep them alive somehow. Yeah, it was traumatizing. It was, it was incredibly traumatizing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was traumatic. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, Martha saying to you, like, mm-hmm. initially, like, oh, you can't do that. You know, like, it's, you're going to have to talk to people and stuff. And what ask this question what um what was your introversion and like fear of people and that aspect of your personality like before you left the community what was sort of the roots of that and what was that like for you at the time Hmm. well like i've already shared like with martha there was very little of that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because she just she put me at ease Mm -hmm partly by just being so weird herself. Like she would just, she'd go like sledding by her. Like I, one time I was walking down the stairs and I looked out the window and I saw her outside and she was like wearing this weird, silly coat she got from someone. And she just looked so ridiculous. And she was standing on top of this little hill and like she had a, sl- she, was, she was sledding like by herself. Like she, she was just grown woman. Like, and like part of me was horrified and just like cringing, like, ah, and, like, doesn't she know like people can see her? What is she doing? <laughs> And the other part of me was like, oh man, that's, a, that's awesome. Like, yeah. I want to, I want to have that freedom. I want to, I want to do it with her. I want to. So I think that's, that's, yeah, that's a total, another reason I, I, I was attracted to her. And it was, you know, my mind, it was, of course I was going to stay with her was she brought out this part of me that I liked, mm. like I liked myself more when I was with her mm. and I had been going through a really rough time. Like I'd been at film school. I'd, I'd basically got my first best friend at film school. He'd come and lived with the community or he moved out to the community to be with me. Uh, and then I found out he was in love with me hmm. and it was super painful and like super, super sad. And he left. Hmm. Um, Cause that, that was definitely not going to fly in the community. And I was, <laughs> I was definitely not at a place where I would was even going to consider that. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that was, fa- I mean, but like with Martha, like, yeah, she, she brought out, like, she brought me out. She like pulled me out of like this, this, this out of my head, out of like all these dark thoughts, all this, like these mental loops. She would just like pull me out. Mm-hmm. And, and I, yeah. So, so it's like, yeah, I, for the most part of the community, like I was very extroverted. I, I felt very comfortable. 
like these i had known these people for years like they i felt respected by most of them it was like i would do all sorts of crazy stuff like we'd have these like crazy costume parties like on halloween and like all these friends would show up and like it was it was amazing like and i just so yeah I, uh, within a certain spectrum i felt very free and, and comfortable and then I, I basically had a whole like private life or like a, basically like a secret life in a certain sense um hmm. um but not very much i mean just uh but but yeah i mean it was yeah so but basically uh yeah, like, like, like I said, with these challenges and things, it's like when I've been the most alive I've ever felt has basically when I've been expressing myself, when I've been playing, when I've been like, like we, we play volleyball and like, and she, she, she loved it too, but she, she like, like I would just go crazy. Like I would, just, it was just, it was, that was one of the spaces where I could just be like totally free and wild. And I'd be, I'd be like diving for the ball, and like sliding on the ground and like injuring myself and like doing, you know, flips, like trying to get the ball and like yelling my head, head off. and. And like, I just loved her reactions. Like I would just, I would make her laugh. And like, it was great. Um, so, well. Yeah. So the introversion was, one of the things I'm hearing is like, maybe that the introversion came out more with people that you didn't know that you felt safe. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. So ba yeah, that was it. I mean, that like basically if I was outside of the context of the community, mm -hmm. And people didn't know who I was. I was completely petr. I mean, I didn't know what it's. I mean, <laughs> like, like it was. It was. I was super, super shy. Like, I, I spent one year, uh, my junior year in high school. They they sent me to a, a little Christian or Catholic school, in Ontario. Hmm. So I basically stayed with a the family there, and you know, so I was like 16, 17. I was 17 and their, their son was like 13 hmm. and he basically was like, he, he kind of like bossed me around and stuff. And like, I would just mm. like take it. And I, I, I was just so, I had no idea what to do or how, how I, how to like, basically I, I was fine. I was better talking with adults. Like I, I, I was more comfortable because like, at least they didn't like tease me. Hmm. Um, but but yeah, that was definitely a, yeah, yeah, that definitely was, was interesting to like basically see what it's like in the, you know, the real world. Mm -hmm. um, and then film school, I was pretty, pretty shy, pretty introverted. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. I, I was part of this youth group at the, uh, <clears throat> in, in Ontario. And they, I, it was basically a youth group that was supposed to be like doing ministry for like, like middle schoolers, but I basically they they had me join just like i would have some other like teenagers to relate to um but like we were putting on this like retreat for these middle schoolers and like <laughs> but this is the famous like moment where i was i was i was supposed to be mingling with them and like you know talking to them about god or something or and i was i was so horrified i was just like looking around for like my other teammates and like and they, but they were off like doing stuff and so i just went into the bathroom and I just like sat on the toilet and just like, just like hated myself. Just like looked, I mean, I remember like looking at my arms and be like, oh, I'm so skinny. I'm so hideous. I just, I, uh, I just my hair is bad. Uh, uh. These kids are not, I mean, it was just like, uh. and then I ended up in that same retreat. I ended up like sitting next to these a couple of kids and I kind of talked to them a little bit. And, and one of them mentioned me at some point or said, said something to the group and and then later on one of my super extroverted kind of you know jock teammates was like oh yeah and they were talking about the retreat and they're like yeah even nat even nat like they, they even mentioned nat at one point like whoa good job nat mm -hmm. and it was just i was so humiliated i was just like mm -hmm. oh or it's, it's something like even even nat like got noticed or something <laughs> or, i don't know uh, yeah so maybe that's what all my challenges maybe, maybe all my challenges are just coming from like this childhood trauma of like of, of of having these humiliating situations and like bowing 
to never have that happen to me again. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that's what I've talked about. Like, you know, I, I see it as like basically like training and like, you know, helping me expand my comfort zone and stuff. But for what, right? Like, what's the end goal? I've never really known for sure. And it, it, it's possible that part of it's just coming from like th- this child, like this, 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 these traumatic experiences of like humiliation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But, you know, I don't, I don't think it's just that because, uh, like I said, like I've, like right now, I'm having fun. Like, this is actually fun talking to you. It's mm-hmm. just fun. This is enjoyable. I'm enjoying it. And it's like, a, but a few years ago, this would have been terrifying and scary. And I, I just, I wouldn't have even done it. I would have never put myself in the position to even have it be a possibility. And yeah, mm-hmm. or like Vibe Camp, like that Vibe Camp was huge, like that of just like, oh my gosh, like, mm-hmm. like here I am and this cr- amazing opportunity to just be crazy and have fun and help other people have fun. And I felt ready. Mm-hmm. Like it was still a little scary, but it's like, I felt ready. Like I knew how to have fun. And I was going to like squeeze the life mm-hmm. out of that, those three days. And I did. <laughs> and it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I, I and I, and I even talked to people that like didn't have a good experience. And part of me just was like, I know what you feel like. I didn't tell them this, but it's like in my mind, I was like, I know, I know, I, I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know, like just part of like 10 years ago, I just would have hung out in the cabin or I would have like hung out with my friends, or, you know, a couple like little safe, safe people, you know, that I, I feel okay with <laughs> No. Nope. So there you go. Yeah. That, that, that was a great confirmation. Like, okay, yeah. All the all the stuff I'm doing. It's paid it's paid it's pay, it's pay it off. Paying off. How did you start doing these discomfort challenges? <sighs> or various challenges um, that you do. <clears throat> well, interestingly, it did start like when I was doing my uh, the when i was selling food mm-hmm. when i was basically mm-hmm. driving around in my truck like every once in a while back then i attributed it to the holy spirit mm-hmm. because that's what i was very you know mm-hmm. I, I believe the holy spirit would kind of like talk to us and nudge us and you know mm-hmm. I, and i grew up with story like my dad like he was exercising people like uh, stories of demons coming out of people stories of like miraculous healings uh i mean he's he had all sorts of crazy crazy stories and so I, I grew up very much believing it. Um, and so like, sometimes like I would be like driving like past someplace. Um, okay, here, here's an example. Like this one town I would go through, like there was a little bar there and there's a few other towns where I would stop at the bar and like people loved it when I came in and they would buy stuff and it was just, it was fun. So I was like, oh man, you know, I wonder if I, I could have that same experience there. And, but I, I was, I was, it was scared the heck out of me. I'd never done it. I was terrified. And so I was driving and then I just stopped. I would I, like every, like I, I'd feel this, like this kind of surging, like sense that here is this opportunity. If you, you don't have to take it, but if you take it, something good will happen or something. I mean, it was just like, and, and sometimes I would ignore it, but a lot of times I'd be like, okay, let's try it and see what happens. Hmm. So like I, I turned around, turned the truck around, drove back and <laughs> it turned out that the, the, the bartender or the owner was like super pissed at me for coming into his bar. It was super crabby at me. The other people were like putting their heads down. Like, like one guy was like, just leave, just leave, dude, dude, just leave. Hmm. And like, he almost like probably started like, I don't know how close I got to like getting punched in the face, but, but I was just like, I was just like playing it off kind of as a joke. And I was just like, like afterwards I realized, oh yeah, he really did not like me being in there. Um, Why didn't they want you to be there? I don't understand. I I have no idea. I mean, I, I talked to one of the other drivers and he was like, oh yeah, that guy is a, he's an asshole. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't, why'd you talk to him? 
Hmm. But I mean, but my guess is like, like it's just a tiny little town, only like a few people in there. He's trying to sell them stuff, trying to sell them alcohol and food. And I come in, be like, hey guys, you want to buy anything? Uh, so you want to buy like, some ice cream? Trying to sell, sell this stuff from your company. That's the only thing I can I can think of, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. But who knows? Like it, it doesn't really matter. It's just like, but it's just, but like, I left there feeling like. I, I guess that that's the thing. Like every once in a while, I would have these feelings. Like if I do this, I, I am going to gain something, even if I don't get a sale or anything. Mm-hmm. And that was a step experience that night. Like walking out of that bar, I, I felt so good about myself. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I hadn't sold anything. Mm-hmm. I hadn't made any money for my family. Mm-hmm. But I was like, whoa! Mm-hmm. I was so scared of doing that, but I did it, and now I feel good. And it's not scary anymore so that was kind of the beginning <clears throat> and then I, I would say the first one the first time i started doing it online was this girl uh dashel barkus um she does a lot of coding stuff mm-hmm. um and that, that's basically why i was on twitter like mm-hmm. when i started to learn how to code mm-hmm. and she was going to do this challenge where like 30 days of discomfort where basically every day you would choose to just you, you just randomly like like ask a stranger for a hundred bucks or lay down on the floor of a store or like just like these random things and but you know things that scared you and she was basing it off of this other guy ted jang or something or jang, i forget jang jang he did a ted talk but he basically did talked about like doing these rejection challenges um the same idea like basically it's just exposure therapy right and so I'd already been following her. She seemed really cool. It it sounded really scary, like. But I was like, okay, if she's willing to do it, it's kind of like with Martha, right? It's like, if if one other person is willing to do it with me, then I can do it. I can do it. So she, she it was basically me and like three other four other people, and we were we were the only ones that actually did it every day. Hmm. But that was one of the the things like, the commitments I made to myself. Like once again, was just like okay. Even if it's like some silly little thing, I am going to do this every day, like that. Um, and I did, and like so that sense of I think that was really helpful too, like that building up that self confidence of like just seeing myself make these little commitments and like build. I was like it was really helpful. Um, so like I, like the first one I was asking a stranger for a hundred dollars, and it took me all day to do it. Like I, I drove to like three different stores, I walked around for hours. And then I finally was like walking out of the mall and like one of the, the, th- the thing I was convinced w- was going to happen was that someone was going to call the cops and have me arrested mm. because that's obviously what someone would do. Right. Uh-huh. If, 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 if some strange man asked you for money uh-huh. and I wasn't even asking for money, I was asking to borrow it, which was even uh-huh. stupider. Like that doesn't even make any sense. Like uh-huh. I'm going to pay him back or something. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Anyway, so I was walking out and like that little voice, I guess, was still there. I was just like, and I saw this mall cop walking toward me. Hmm. And I was like, the very person I was most afraid of. And so I said, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh. And he's like, yeah, what? Huh? It's like, uh, I've got a really weird question for you, but uh, can I borrow $100? And he just stared at me. And he's like, for what? <laughs> you know but, but part, part of the deal was i couldn't actually talk about what i was yes. doing so i said like uh what well, just uh, this experiment thing or uh, something <laughs> and he was like uh no 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 uh, no <laughs> and i was like okay thank you okay thank you. and I, I just walked away and yeah i mean it was, nothing happened mm-hmm. nothing happened well not even that but it's like I also realized like he he probably thought it was funny. Hmm. Like it was, it was also on his work shift. Right. It, it, it could have been like, and that's that's the other thing of like talking to people during those 30 days was so hard. Like one of them was I I asked a stranger to give me a compliment. Hmm. That took like an hour to get my courage up for that one. Like that hmm. was so humiliating. Uh-huh. Um but one of the ladies, like she was like this older woman, she like started hitting on me. Mm. Like she's like, "You remind me of my son's friend." And, oh, I, do I know you? And, like, <laughs> and, and then and she gave me. She I asked for a compliment. She's like, "You're you're very handsome. Mm-hmm. You're very handsome." Yeah. 
and it was fun like I just and I I, I complimented her on something and, and I was like oh my god like what people could actually not only not hate me mm. but actually appreciate me mm. like I actually I could tell like I was she enjoyed that weird interaction that we had. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? So I mean, I, I guess that goes back to like treat, treat strangers as old friends. Mm. Like, like when you're meeting an old friend, you have this deep sense that they're going to enjoy seeing you. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. like part, I, wanna, I don't know if you're an old friend yet, but it's like, I had that sense, like doing the podcast, like, I, I don't know what we're going to talk about. I don't know what we're going to do, whatever, but. I have the sense that you're going to at least enjoy seeing me mm-hmm, definitely. and just the, the, the mount. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it, it's so, it's just like the stress just, you know, deescalates just goes away. Mm-hmm. Just having that sense like, yeah, it's, it's going to, it's, it's probably gonna be a pleasant experience mm. <laughs> for, for both parties. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what I found with strangers is that for the most part, if you're, if you're friendly and positive, they will actually enjoy the interaction. Mm-hmm. What kinds so, of challenges have you done since that time? Uh, I've done uh, all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Do you, have you have you seen you? Uh, okay, one one challenge I did was <laughs> you were giving out side quests, and you told me to. Uh, write a blog post about all my challenges which was amazing because i had never done it and now i i have something to give people when they ask about it and i also have a list of things i've done so let's see um i did 60 days of a 60 minute meditation every day i posted a youtube video every day i replied to every uh twitter post i read for one week um I said awesome 1,000 times. Uh, I said yes to every request I got for one week. Um, oh, and because I never, uh, this one was so incredibly hard, but partly to face into that fear of like dating and stuff that I basically avoided. I, I asked out like five different attractive strangers. Hmm. Uh, it took me like an entire month to actually do it. Hmm. Um, and basically like, you know, asked for the number or something like, hmm. But that, that was, oh my God, mm. that was so humiliating. Mm. Oh, I just, it, uh, it killed me. It killed me so bad. Um, I've also done 30 days of saying, I love you, Nat, like in every spare second. Um, I was blindfolded for 24 hours. I wore upside down vision goggles for 24 hours. I did 30 days of 30 minute meta meditation. That was mm. with you. Mm-hmm. uh 100 days of gratitude journaling that was an, the, another thing you gave me uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, you you gave me that uh that side quest too uh-huh. oh my gosh see that's part of the thing that's that, so going back to like dash and her 30 days of discomfort like one thing i've found really fun for whatever reason is basically doing it with other people like either asking people to give me a challenge or seeing them do it mm-hmm. uh like another friend i had um Stuart Alsop, he, uh, he was reaching out to a stranger for 30 days. Like every day he would just like, you know, message someone on Twitter or like talk to a stranger in public. And I saw him doing that. And it was like, all right, let's do it. Sounds good. You know, let's, let's, let's do it. And I think that's when you reached out to me through that challenge. Uh, cause we are met you before, serious? But I think that's who you got back in touch. Are you kidding and, me? Matt and I met at a conference in 2019 <laughs> and I, it was just like Nat came up to talk to me. He's like, I liked your talk. And I was like, oh, you seem nice. And then you messaged me later that summer. And that's why we got back in touch. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I gotta look at my DMs now. Mm-hmm. Um that's crazy, man. So and it's but it's just stuff like that. It's just like that's what I'm saying. Like, like I have basically seen now through all these like weird things I've done like all of these amazing, like unexpected good things happen Mm -hmm. that I could never have predicted. Mm -hmm. So basically like, like part of it has been like strategic. Um, And I I saw this in like my antique business too. So like after I, you know, I sold frozen food, Mm -hmm. I basically started doing selling, buying and selling stuff part-time and then eventually got 
to where I could, you know, replace our very pitiful income. Mm. And I would see that happen all the time. Like I would just meet some person randomly and start and just like basically just strike up a conversation and they'd be like, Oh yeah, my, my grandpa, he had a barn full of stuff like a hundred years ago and it's out on the farm and you could come out. Yeah. Come on out. You can take a look at it. And I would go out and I would dig through it and I would buy a bunch of stuff and clean it up and sell it. But there were so many, like the synchronicity and like just these happy little accidents and, you know, like, yeah, like I'm, I'm a huge believer that, and I don't, I don't, I don't see it as the Holy Spirit anymore, but I do see it as basically just the fact that if you're looking, if you're expecting good things to happen, you will see them. Like you'll see opportunities. Hmm. And if you're involving other people th and they like you, they will, like people would call me up. People would say, hey, Nat, I was at this place and the, there was a bunch of stuff that looked like the kind of stuff you buy. Here's the guy's phone number. Hmm. So, so yeah. So yeah, I, I'm not really sure like what kind of, like I said, like, like why, why am I on Twitter? Why am I doing this stuff? I'm not really sure. Like what, <laughs> like, like when I was selling antiques, like I was trying to like, flip stuff like i'd buy stuff for 10 bucks and sell it for 100 bucks or i'd buy stuff for 50 and sell it for you know 200 and i was i was always trying to sell it like within the days or weeks after i bought it so that i could basically pay the bills right and but on the other hand i was also doing this long game because i, I would see the same dealers i would see the same people at these places and i started building these really valuable relationships with people um that were also like uh, really good people. I liked them. And there were certainly people I met that I did not like, and I did not do business with, hmm. and I didn't, I did not help. <laughs> <laughs> like, so that was very interesting to see too. It was like some strangers are actual assholes hmm. and stupid people. And I do not want to talk to them. Hmm. I do not, I do not trust them and I don't want to do business with them. So, so starting to develop that discernment of like, who are the people that are playing the kind of game I'm playing? Hmm. And I was, I basically got pretty good at finding those people. Hmm. And I think I'm doing the same thing with Twitter. Hmm. Like I'm basically collecting people who are, who are honest, who are friendly, who, who enjoy doing things, who have, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to, I, I don't, I don't know what the categories are, but, hmm. but yeah. So I have no idea what we're talking about anymore. So you better ask me another question. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> uh, see you, <laughs> love you, ask you questions. <laughs> Iterate. <laughs> Great. Um, what uh, I, it, I, I was grateful that you mentioned about um, connecting the dot of like, oh yeah, I don't see it anymore as the Holy Spirit. I see it as <clears throat> opportunities. Um, what, yep. what can you talk more about that? And like, how did you see it before? How do you see it now? What's different between those two things? <clears throat> I guess Yeah, what's the difference? <laughs> I guess the, the scope of opportunities. Like I remember talking to, to a community member one time about, we were Catholic, right? But this, it was some Anglican. So like we, there's only male, man, like man, men, priests, like there's no women priests. Mm -hmm. And I was reading this article. I don't even know how I found it, but it was from some Anglican woman. And she was talking about her, her path to the priesthood and like her journey. And, and she basically said, yeah, you know, I was, I was praying and I was discerning and eventually I felt the Holy spirit call me to the priesthood. Mm. And I share this with, with, you know, one of the community people and well, it was my dad. I just said my dad, it's not, it's not that big a person, but, but, his, but his, his, uh, his response was like, Oh, well, well, Matt, yeah, that, that probably wasn't the Holy spirit. Mm. 
<laughs> like that, that I mean, because I mean, the Holy Spirit wouldn't call her to do something that was not, you know, that basically God didn't want, which was female priests. Um, and I just remember thinking like, oh, but her description sounds an awful lot like all your stories and mm. all your crazy miracle stuff that you did and all the weird stuff you did. Like, it sounds pretty similar. And like, how, like what, what if it felt the same for her? Uh-huh. And so I would say like, that's the main difference. It's just like, I'm much more open in a certain sense to what I could consider the Holy Spirit uh-huh. um, because it's not, it's not basically, I'm not defining it. I'm not defining it as like God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and some people probably like their, their definition of God is probably big enough that would encompass like everything I've done. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's basically like Martha's approach. Like, you know, she's, she's still a you know, very devout Catholic and stuff, but her feeling of God is on such as like this deep personal level mm-hmm. um, that she basically sees like, she, she would say, yeah, basically all the stuff I've been doing has been, responding to some some call from god of some sort <laughs> or at least he can he can somehow work it for good or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she would de- she would yeah but but yeah i think i think that's the biggest thing is just taking away that sense of like possibility and opportunity from a specific frame and trying to take more ownership of it myself um and i'm still working on that because i still like basically one thing that happened after i left the community I was just so lost and just like no identity, no, no direction. So I, I started like getting really interested in like, I don't know if you've heard of Dave Ramsey. Mm, I know of him, but I don't know too much. Okay. About him. But he, he's like this big Christian uh, financial guru guy. And he basically mm-hmm. talks about baby steps where you pay off, you basically save an emergency fund of a thousand dollars. Then you start paying off your debts. Then you save like a three month emergency fund. And I got really hooked on him and I was like, oh man, okay. So like the community was all about living by faith and just like, you know, just God will take care of us and everything. We're not going to save for retirement because that wouldn't be trusting God, which, you know, is very logical, but like here I was, I was out there super poor and like not, didn't have enough money. And so I I wanted some money, but I also, I also wanted to believe in God still. You know, I I, I want, so it's like, I was trying to find some way of like believing in God without, without uh, starving and, you know, being in an even worse position. So like he, he was a kind of nice compromise. Like he, he was, very, you know, sounded like he really knew what he was talking about. And he just said, follow these steps and you'll, you'll be okay. And, and a lot of his stuff like has really helped us. Like it really helped us, but I've also over the years realized like, okay, that's just another frame. That's just another, he's just setting up another kind of game for people to play. And the real world is infinitely more, there's infinite more possibilities and, and, you know, so like, like going, when I learned how to code, right. I, I told you like that basically saved my life. I almost didn't do it because we had, we were debt-free, but super poor, but debt-free. And I, I was clinging to that identity so hard of like being debt-free and debt is bad. And we're going to, we're going to go bankrupt. And Dave Ramsey said, debt is bad. <laughs> Dave Ramsey said, debt is bad. And I don't want Dave Ramsey to be wrong because everything else he said might be wrong. So I, I don't want him to be wrong. And I, I remember my dad asking me, like, he's like, Nat, would you rather be debt free or happy? And I was like, oh, uh, hmm, I guess happy would be better. Uh-huh. But like, part of me was like, no, no, we must, you must obey the rules. We must, you know, stick, stay firm, stay on firm. So, anyways, we ended up going like $25,000 in debt. Um, for the to pay for the school to pay for living expenses my family you know martha and the kids lived with her parents for a while they lived with my parents for a while i lived by myself in atlanta for six months while i learned how to code and got a job Mm -hmm. um and it was amazing it was it was amazing not to have to think about money for six months i was able to make friends again i was able to like actually build these really strong you know relationships with people i was able to focus on something besides money um, and then we ended up paying it off like in two years and now we're debt free again. Oh no, except we have our house, but Dave, Dave Ramsey said you could go into debt for a house. That, that, that was, he said that you, could, you can go into debt for a house, nothing else, nothing else. Uh, so uh, interesting. Uh, 
let's see. There's a couple of directions I'd love to go from here. What well, maybe just to stay with the discomfort theme for a bit first? Um, <clears throat> what do you think uh, the most uncomfortable challenge you've done is? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well okay i mean there's a couple that come to mind like one of them was singing in public mm. like that that was one because i've all actually yeah i've always been like super like self-conscious about singing and stuff um or at least at a certain point i developed it so I, I went to the downtown atlanta to the park and it turned out there was like this music festival going on which i hadn't even known about but like all these people were going to the park I couldn't even get inside without a ticket. So I just, I stood outside the park and all these like high school kids and college kids were like walking on the sidewalk. And I started, I put my hat out, which was even more embarrassing. I had this top hat. I put my hat out. So it was like, it looked like I was actually asking for money. Like busking. Exactly. Right. Uh -huh. So like, it was even like more humiliating to me uh -huh. because I was like, it, the mental image was like, Oh my gosh, who who is this guy is singing terribly? Oh, and he's asking for money. Mm -hmm. Who does he think he is? Oh my god, it's cringe, <laughs> cringe. Ah, oh, can't look. Ah. Like, and that's basically my reaction to buskers in general. Uh -huh. Like, I'm I'm, just, I'm so cringe. I just uh -huh. I cringe so much. It's just uh -huh. so painful just to watch them. I just like, uh, they're out here. They're getting like barely any money. They're just they're total. Must be like total losers. It's not even that good uh so i did it though i i basically it, it took me a while i was just standing there like in a cold sweat and then like a lot of a lot of these challenges like i would i wouldn't even know what what would trigger it but it, something snapped or something happened and i just started singing and then once i started singing it got easier one of the songs i sang partly was like uh was bad guy by billy eilish <laughs> <laughs> for some reason i don't know mm -hmm. uh but then it turned out she was actually playing at the park that everyone was going to and i <laughs> and it was just, it was like basically what i expected people would like kind of look at me quickly and then look away and kind of you know smile and be like ah but once i started doing it like i felt uh, i felt free uh -huh. I, it was basically like an altered state it was just like i basically like went from here to up here and i was just like here i am like you know, probably a lot of the challenges I've done is just because I haven't done a lot of drugs. Uh -huh. So, so I, probably a lot of people probably, when they want to feel like a different, like different, they just take drugs. Mm. But like, I basically never got into that. Mm. Um, I've smoked weed one time. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that I, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm curious if there's something to do with that too. Mm. But it's just like, but yeah, just the sense of feeling alive, just like, whoa, like this is different. Like I'm, I'm outside my, my normal place where I live. Like my normal predictions are completely wrong. Like I, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And it feels really, it felt good. It felt good to do that. Um, and then, in, so like, that was really hard for me. The compliments one was really hard for me. Um, the meta one, like that was actually, I was reading my thread about that one and uh that one was was very difficult too like i've always had a hard time like doing any kind of meditation just because it triggers all my perfectionism stuff and religious mm. stuff and mm. but that one specifically was hard especially like thinking of like loving myself and loving other people mm -hmm. um and the interesting thing like one one way that helped me was basically like it was one image that came to me during one one of the meditations was I was this giant, like 12 foot toddler and all these uh, tiny little adults were like running at me and like hitting me and yelling at me. And I was just walking through them mm. completely unperturbed, totally like happy. Mm. And I, I remember I saw my parents, like they were angry and I picked them up and I like, I carried my parents, my little, they were grown ups, but they were small. And I, I carried them to, to, to a bed and I like tucked them in and <laughs> yeah, I, I was really, that was really powerful. But it's like, but in general, yeah, like trying to like love myself or love other people, it's like would rate that. So that that was hard from 
from for a longer challenge. Um, I did another one where I, I didn't refer to myself for one week, and that was incredibly hard just to be consistent. Normally, like, I'm really consistent, but like that one, like I was constantly forgetting and constantly just, uh, yeah, and it was, that was really hard. And like basically with my family, I had to stop stop at like halfway through because I, I'd be like, like Martha would try to be talking to me like with the, you know, about something happening with the kids. And I'd be like, well, there's a sense of, of <laughs> anger here and of some feelings of, of uh, not knowing what to do. And she'd be like, like, I mean, it, it was, so, that, so but that, that was one, I mean, so in general and online, I would, I would still do it, but, but yeah, there's different challenges, hard in different ways. Mm -hmm. talking like asking girls out like that was one that like oh my gosh that that triggered so much stuff in me mm -hmm. uh so much like old old fears that you know basically like i said like with martha like i found out she liked me before mm -hmm. i ever had to like even talk to her like mm -hmm. it, it was basically like an arranged marriage in that <laughs> sense. so uh -huh. i i cheated i like uh -huh. i uh, took a shortcut uh-huh so like basically just like walking up to girls like in the grocery store <laughs> like oh my god like but like once again like and there's there's actually one girl that she even kind of like she she you know said all of them said no like uh -huh. but like but one of them one of them even like she actually seemed kind of like interested and like uh -huh. I, I remember thinking like afterwards like wow oh like i she actually you know it wasn't like this terrifying thing for her it wasn't it was actually like a pleasant experience so. <laughs> So like that, that was healing. That felt good. I was like, okay, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. It's uh, all, all I know is just that, yeah. If you have a, if you're afraid of something, what I would say is like, if you're afraid of something, it means you haven't actually experienced it, mm. or you haven't like. There's something like, like, like I was talking to Marth about this recently. Or like, what is horror? What is a sense of horror? Like, uh, uh, I was thinking about Lovecraft. You know, I've never actually read Lovecraft, but like that Lovecraftian horror. And I was like reading these descriptions of it and stuff. And one common factor is that it's always undefined. Mm -hmm. It's always like this weird shape in the darkness, kind of like, mm. you know, with weird, like maybe some tentacles or something and like movement and sound. And you're trying to figure out what it is, but you can't actually see it. And you have no idea what, you know, what's going to happen. How powerful is it? It's just like, that is horror. Like that. Mm. If you know, like, like I've been stung by wasps, right? And like, I look at a wasp and like, I don't feel horror. Mm. Like I have a certain kind of like respect for it. And it's like, I'm not terrified of it. Like maybe if it actually started like attacking me, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be scared. But it, the wasp itself is not horrifying because I, I felt the pain. I know what it could do to me. You know, it, it, it's known. I know it. I know that pain. But to me, like the greatest fears really are the ones where we have not experienced. It's mm. just in our imagination. It's just our imagination. And it's like the monster under the bed. If you actually saw the monster under the bed, you would, you would be able to do something about it, right? Like you'd be able to run away or fight it or whatever, but just not knowing what it looks like or if it's there or what it is or what it could do to you, that is the most terrifying thing. Mm. That's horror. That's mm. horror. Mm. And I think to me, like, yeah, with people, I've had this horror. Like, what are you? What are you? What, what could you do to me? And I think if most people are honest, like, I think that's a pretty normal thing. Mm. Like, I don't know what you're thinking right now. I mm. really don't. Mm. I have no idea what you're thinking. Mm. And that's kind of scary. Mm. I'm going to eat some chips. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I'm, well, I'm thinking about darkness and this Lovecraft theme. And one of the things I'm doing right now is um, trying to integrate a lot of darkness uh, that's been present for me. It feels like there's 
yeah, like a, from an IFS or parts perspective, it's like there's different parts of me. And one of the parts is like a dark part that can say dark things that are not uh, sitting well with some of the other parts of me that are maybe like kinder or loving or more sweet and like how I like to present and it's more comfortable. And then there's like some really dark stuff in there about people and the universe and who I am and who other people are and um, how to square those is like, so um, that's like an iterative process I'm working on. And um, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, just you're, you're talking about Lovecraft mm. and oh, wait, what, the fear of the unknown. Oh, there you go. But what, what is more unknown in a certain sense than yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I think anyone that has like a, a slight amount of awareness knows they don't know who they are. It mm -hmm. goes back to that, that question, right? Who am I? Who am I? Like, what if I am a monster? Mm. I, who know? like, who knows? Like, mm. like I've done, I've done things that are scary. I've hurt people. I've done. Like who knows? And like I, I, I see stories of other terrible people, mm. and like, how do I like? How do I know that I will not do the same thing? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a great point. The horror of ourselves, like the unknown, the unknowns. Mm. Like, do you feel that? Do you feel like there's parts of you that you don't know? I currently don't. Uh, I bet. I bet. Th I bet there are, but that's not how I experience it. It's more like I don't know how to integrate certain parts that I'm aware of. Uh, Interesting. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure. That, I mean, I, I, of course, there. I guess I'm reminded of like Donald Rumsfeld talking about known unknowns and unknown unknowns, and like, <laughs> it's like I'm. So sure there's there no unknown known unknowns. unknowns. Yeah. Uh huh. But there are known yeah. unknowns, and it's more. Those are more about how do they integrate with, like, it, just for example, how does this dark part integrate with this, the more loving aspects of myself? Or, um, yeah, but isn't isn't that kind of the whole definition of a dark part, is one that you can't see clearly? I mean, like that's, I mean, not not to disagree with you, but I'm just saying, like, the darkness itself is not scary. It's what's hidden in the darkness. Like that's what make that is why the dark is scary, is because we don't know. We don't know. We, we, we don't that's, know. That's not really my experience of it. Uh I, I, I can imagine that being true. Like that definitely seems true generally, but what I'm referring to, that's not my experience <laughs> of it. Uh, oh, okay. It's Interesting. Like, okay. It's like we, what, give me some more details then. Like what 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 are you what are you uh what's your experience? Well, uh like use a different term instead of dark. Like how would you describe it without that term? One of the, th to take a step back, one of the things I have worked on for, I don't know, arguably a very long time since I was a kid, but in a certain way, in a new chapter in the last year or so <laughs> of my life is, uh, being able to speak and write various messages that come to me, hmm. shall we say, hmm. uh, words, Interesting. you know, okay. uh, and sometimes those messages are very loving and kind and <clears throat> wise and encouraging and supportive, uh, and I try to share those as publicly and widely as I can because they seem to benefit people and they inspire me. Like a lot of them are just like, hey, this is really inspiring and clarifying for me. They're almost all of these messages are first and foremost, like clarifying for me. Uh, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yes, mm -hmm. this is good. <clears throat> and then it's like maybe other people would like to see things this way. I, I wrote about this recently. I said, I see myself as a messenger, but it's less like I'm a prophet and more like I'm a mailman. <laughs> it's like you've got some. Mail. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, 
So these messages come to me and some of them are like very loving and supportive and encouraging and inspiring. And it's like, okay, this should be distributed widely. Like people should know about this, it will help them. And then there are other things that feel like they're coming from a different aspect of myself that are, um, I can't use that word. So I will take you up on your challenge here. And mm. they concern different topics, often like death or suffering or distrust or pain mm -hmm. or okay. sorrow <clears throat> or other things. And, and often and the tone of voice in which I experience them internally and the words come out is very different. It's, it's like a different person is speaking. And mm. it is, these also are useful to me. Uh, like, ah, this is clarifying. So I'm not afraid of it um, mm. in a certain sense. It's like, oh, thank you. Now I understand this thing about suffering or death or distrust or people or whatever. That's like, <clears throat> I can't use the word, <laughs> uh, 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 maybe uncomfortable or, or shadowy or, or sinister. Um, but mm, uh, okay. but it's helpful for me. I experienced this helpful. And yet it's like, oh, I don't know that this is skillful to widely distribute in the same way that like messages of love and encouragement and inspiration are. I, I don't even know if they're helpful for anyone other than me. I'm like, this is helpful for me. This is a puzzle piece I right. need. It's not, um, right. but it's kind of, uh, so there's this account <clears throat> that I post these from, which is not hard to find out. I'm not going to say the name of it here. It's not hard to find out what it is. It's currently locked. I'll unlock it again at some point. But um, uh, yeah, I, th I think I follow it. Oh. You do, yeah. And 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 friends can ask me about it too. But it's like that's where the dark stuff goes. Oh, sorry, use the word. That's where these things go, and uh, they're all helpful for me. But how that all fits together is currently very unclear to me. And I foresee that in the future, fast forward a day or a month or a year or ten years or fifty years. Like this will be clear to me. Ah, this is how all this all fits together. This is how to speak about it skillfully, where to speak about it, when. Some of it is like what should be public and what should be private, what's useful yep. to share in what contexts, uh, what's actually beneficial for others to hear and just me to hear. But um, how to integrate all that is not clear to me at this time. And so I'm I'm sort of more cautious about sharing those kinds of messages that have this different. Yeah, but at least you're at least you're listening to it. I mean, that, that's the thing. Like at least you're. I mean, I, I would say you probably are integrating it at least on a personal level or trying to and then i mean that, that's more important than the public thing you know, in a certain sense right i mean like, like eventually like you'll 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 get it like yeah i could i could see it basically like integrating on a personal level in a, in a way that then makes it very easy to share or i mean it might be a different message i mean that, that's that's an interesting thing like you're using different accounts and I, i've definitely thought about using different accounts on twitter but I, I tweeted a while ago, and I, 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 it's one of my favorite tweets. But I, I basically said something like, uh, "Like all my, or some, something like all my alts use the same account, which is this one or something." <laughs> but but basically, it was the idea that that's like, like, like there's at least like four or five different voices that I tweet in, and for whatever it's 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 terrible from a branding perspective and it's terrible from like a gaining follower perspective but it's been how i've been using twitter mm -hmm. um and i think there is something for me that's been helpful it's just like being like oh okay i guess nat is talking about this today mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the other part's like oh no no don't say that ah. what so, are the different voices but, that you experience oh, oh i don't know hmm. Uh, I mean, I try to be, I started off being super positive and stuff, uh, partly because I was trying to get a job. Um, so mo most of them are, and, and also because like, I feel like I have enough negative shit, um, that like talking about it really does not help or it's like it. Yeah. It's, it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, especially like one thing I've learned from like panic attacks and stuff and like anxiety disorder, I've never been diagnosed, but um is basically like that constant need for reassurance like this is what i would have like with a panic attack like i start freaking out about some usually like health related like death I, I get convinced i'm dying of something <clears throat> and my tendency was to like basically go to the doctor so i would go to the emergency room i would go to the <clears throat> or just like call someone up and talk to them and and eventually i've gotten to the point now where like the last time I had a panic attack, nobody even knew. 
nobody even knew like i was sitting there like oh shit oh shit i'm dying oh my gosh and i, I went to the bathroom and i sat in the bathroom and like you know like but basically one thing when you when you when you have like high fear like you basically like you know crap right i mean it's like <laughs> you get ready to die like you're mm-hmm. dying and so I was, just, I was sitting there on the toilet and i was just like like 90 percent of me 99 percent was convinced i was gonna die and then like this one percent was like matt this is probably a panic attack just just wait it out see what happens just what it's probably yeah and i think i even recorded a video by myself like talking that, that was mm. kind of fun mm. like wow. in the mid in the middle of it oh. just like see, see if i could do it like huh. see like to talk through my emotions because yeah so i guess that's the thing like all these challenges and stuff i've done man like it's like like i have felt fear on a level that is probably close to the peak of humanly possible hmm. and like in these panic attacks hmm. and like i have i've basically reconciled myself to death multiple times hmm. and that's basically what i did like sitting there on the toilet like the reason I didn't reach out to people, the reason I didn't ask for like reassurance was because I was ready to die. Mm-hmm. Like part of me was like, okay, like we're, we're going to basically bet that this is not like a fatal thing that's happening right now. We're, we're going to basically bet that it's a panic attack, even though like emotionally and stuff, like I feel like this is death. Mm-hmm. And So how do we start talking about that? I asked you about the different voices that you write from on Twitter. Oh yeah. Okay. So there you go. So I'm, that's one voice is the fear. Mm -hmm. So basically I never tweet out of fear. Mm -hmm. Fear doesn't get, fear doesn't get a voice. Mm -hmm. Like in my, in my mind, like what I'm, if I'm basically asking for reassurance from people in my experience, that only increases the fear. Mm. Like that increases the fear. Mm. like that basically says oh yeah oh oh this is or or maybe maybe that doesn't increase it but it basically takes away my sense of being able to deal with it mm-hmm. on my own mm. um do you ask your wife for it, reassurance i i have yep i mean like like one time one, one of the worst ones i ever had like we were all these terrible things were happening we just like the kids were at this place like we were in california visiting friends in our rv we had we had gone to this place it was not working out the people there did not like us like they were we were we had planned to stay for a couple of days it was just it was so awful the kids had found these newts in the pond that were they were playing with them and like brought them into the rv and they were like crawling around and then we looked them up and they were like one of the most toxic venomous newts in the world and just like touching the skin can like kill you Cause they, I mean, oh my God. Like, so like that night, like that was one of the worst nights of my life. Um, and like all the Martha and the kids were in bed and I was like, I think I even woke up. I think I woke up like in a panic attack and like thought like I, I'd been having heart problems too. Like I'd been having heart problems. So like, like I had a very plausible case that I was going to, I was having a heart attack like right there. And so I woke Martha up. I was like, okay, Martha, I'm probably having a panic attack, but I think I, I might be having a heart attack. And, and she was like, okay. Yeah, I was like, nah, yeah, it's probably a panic attack. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so yeah, she's been a huge help. But then that, that night, like I basically, I was like, okay, I'm probably going to die. Do I want to spend the re- last moments of my life begging for reassurance from other people, keeping Martha awake, um giving into this fear and i was like fuck that hmm. like i'm gonna die happy and so i started like i was just like dancing around like everyone was sleeping in the rv and i was like in the living room just like dancing silently and i just, just danced there for like 10 15 minutes and then things slowly subsided and i was like okay i'm gonna go to sleep So, so yeah, what, what voices do I, do I share? I mean, it's like, yeah, not fear. 
like basically i try to share like the voice that that's like that was willing to die happy hmm. the, the, the basically like was like okay whatever who, who, who cares if we're gonna die whatever now whatever hmm. just love yourself just there's there's no shame there's no shame so yeah i don't know i guess that there's a business kind of there's a hustle hustle net like that you know basically like <laughs> if, if i like if i ever had a course or something or lost my job i probably like you know like i, I i've played that game before you know i like kind of like promoting myself in certain ways um that that voice doesn't come out very much anymore um mostly a lot of times like i identify with what you're saying like just like this like these kind of like words or phrases that come to me and i'll just i, I think i'm like a fortune cookie tweets which every everyone hates but it's just like you know like i i'll, I'll tweet out little things like that um there's also the the nat the just like kind of like the 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 dad and the husband or not the husband because i don't talk about that too much but but i'll tweet stuff about my family or like when we were in the rv like just kind of like but you know bio, biographicals kind of interesting things mm -hmm um then there's also just like the kind of like the trickster playful just you know improv nat that just like likes to say funny you know basically just riff off people and like go back and forth and just you know just do improv like i i really enjoy that um so yeah there you go yeah but yeah, I guess that's the thing with with fear. It's just like I have I have this super close experience of fear, and yeah, I think part of my integration will probably be like actually like accepting it more or not, <laughs> like even the fear, like just finding a like seeing how it's actually helped me or like that it actually is like this part that's lovable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. that makes sense i'm excited so, for that nat yeah i have, yeah we'll see see what it, what, it, what that means hmm. Hmm. i'm gonna seems like a good moment for some silence mm -hmm. We were talking just now about fear. And mm. You talked mm. earlier about cringe and like <laughs> specifically with buskers and, you know, but that, that seemed like a theme as well. And I'm wondering how you think about cringe now and fear and how do you see what that is? So one time I was probably like 12 or maybe I was older, like 14, 14 or so. And we were going to go on this youth trip. And this girl that I really liked was, uh, was going to be go going with us and stuff. And I, uh, my mom cut my hair <laughs> and, and I was super particular about like how I styled my hair and, <laughs> Like, I don't know where I even got, I mean, we, we live in this, I don't even know where I got the idea, but, you know, this, this, this weird style, I would like spike it like really carefully and like use all this gel and like oh. usually just looked terrible. I mean, just, whatever. <laughs> it's just, well, why, why not? But for whatever reason, I was like super particular about it. And she got like, cut my hair and she cut it too short for me to like spike it uh. and, and, or you do it in the way, like I, like I, I had to do it. And I was so humiliated. Like I didn't like leave the house for like an entire day. And I was just like wearing a hat over my head. And I was just like, I was like, I'm, I'm going to go on this trip and this girl's going to see me. 
Uh, I'm, I'm doomed. We've my hair is bad. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, it's, it's so bizarre, like, even talking about it, because, like, it's your hair. Like, I mean, that to me, that was, like, the one selling point I had, apparently. Huh? Like, that was the one thing. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, you have some good hair now. What, I mean, come now. Come now. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm, st- I'm still pretty, pretty vain, but it's a, uh, it's much, I'm much freer in uh-huh. terms of how my hair looks. But it's so weird. It's just so weird to like what, fixate on this one thing, and be like that, that is the. Th-. And like I even remember my older brother, like he was like super extroverted and just like comfortable with other people, and uh-huh. he, he had friends outside the community. Uh-huh. But he, he like he came and he knew he heard I was having a bad time, and he sat down and was like, oh, that. In my experience with girls, like, like it really is more about the personality. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, like I just, I was just like, ah, what a shut, shut up, whatever. No, it's about the uh, hair, man. <laughs> like, let's get yeah, this right. Straight. Well, that, right, and it's like, but it's like in a certain sense, like, probably because of my self, whatever. It's like, if if it was my personality, like, I was screwed. Like, oh, it was either my oh, hair or nothing. Oh, like, my hair was like the one thing, oh, <laughs> which was oh, so so naive, right? Oh. Um. So, anyways, yeah. So, like cringe right like what does that even what does that mean it's basically like when you see someone when you see something doing someone doing something that to you would would feel absolutely humiliating and like or you've been humiliated for or you've seen other people humiliated for and but of course the, the, you know because i was so self-aware like I realize, like, oh my God, I'm I'm styling my hair this way. Like, some people are probably going to think I'm pretentious. Mm-hmm. Like, they're they're going to think I'm like it's not it's going to like they're they're going to like they're going to accuse me of like being too self conscious and like so like, it was this total like unwinnable situation. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, cringe. I mean, I, I think that's the the main thing is just is like cringe is just like when you hate yourself. Mm-hmm. Like you don't you don't cringe about anything that you don't give a crap about. Like it's only sit it's only when people do things that you yourself feel insecure about, or have learned to basically stop doing, or have learned to like. You realize other people think is bad, and terrible, and so you you you're really careful not to do that. Um. So I I really think it's learned behavior. It's it's very it's very learned and it's very. And different people will cringe at different things because it's uh, just just like, like I said, like with street performers. My wife loves street performers, like Mar, like Mar, like she she. Well, I mean, she'll dance in the street, so like she's she's, not, she's fine with that. But she she actually yeah she actually enjoys it. Huh. So it's, it's it's not an objective thing. Like there's no objectively cringy anything. I don't I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So, yeah, it's, oh, you know what it is? It's disgust. Cringe is a disgust feeling. It's like an actual, like, visceral, like, nauseous kind of like, ugh, like, ugh, like, gross, like, mm-hmm. weird. Like, um, Ah, so that okay, I think that's the relationship between cringe and fear then. Is that you are afraid the, the greatest fear I had was making people feel disgust. Hmm. Or, or at least like triggering that because it's like I knew what that felt like. And of course it's not, not that I did anything with it. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> But it, but it's like a repulsion, yeah. It's like it's like there is like this visceral repulsion that you feel when you cringe, and trying to avoid making people feel that way seems really important. Hmm. I don't know. So like when I looked at my hair and it was bad, I I cringed. I felt disgust at myself. I felt this loathing. So of course I assumed everyone else felt it. Right? Like, why wouldn't they feel it? Like, I, it was obvious. Oh, it was, oh. 
Gross. Your hair is gross. You're a disgusting person. So I think, I think that's been helpful for me, just realizing cringe is subjective. Hmm. It's not objective. It is not the subjective thing. It is totally subjective. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so basically, like, when I see people on Twitter like making fun of people and stuff, like, so there's another voice. I, I, I almost never make fun of people. Like, I saw this guy making fun of this big account a, f- a few days ago, and I came up with this amazing reply. I was like, it would have been so funny and witty and everyone would have liked it and i was like it wasn't even so much like what he would feel like the the guy if he saw it Mm -hmm. it was more just like if i do this i am going to be increasing my fear of other people doing it to me Hmm. because that's what i so i think i think that's a huge thing it's just like if i am going to if i am going to be jumping in on the bandwagon and insulting this person for doing something like I didn't even think it was that cringeworthy. I didn't even think it was that bad what he was taught, what he was being made fun of for. But everyone else did. Mm. And I was like, if I do that, I am never going to forget that. And there's always going to be a part of me that's always going to, like, if I'm in that situation, is going to be watching me mm-hmm. and, and keeping me from doing that. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you're ever with friends that like gossip about each other, it's, it's so like intoxicating to like be on the in group but you also know that they would do the exact same thing mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gossip is not so bueno. Yeah. But it feels good. I mean, that's, the, I, I guess that's the thing is like, it feels good. It feels good to feel like I am not the weird one. Like they're like someone else is the weird one. Mm. Um, so maybe even cringe, like people like watching cringe videos. Mm. Like if you go on YouTube, like there's mm. cringe compilations, like people enjoy it. Mm. Like they enjoy the feeling of cringe. Wow, today I learned that there are cringe compilations. And yeah, you should, go, you should go watch some of those. My guess is that you probably wouldn't cringe very much. Yeah. Like my, my guess is that you would probably feel a lot of like just empathy, a lot of, you know. I feel, you know, you, you when I watch feel... um, comedies, they're often okay. unbearable for me. Like I have to like pause oh. every few seconds. Uh, Interesting. Okay. But, like, what, give me an example. Like what's a scene that like. Oh, why, I don't know. Why, why um, is it? Uh, gosh, what's an example? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay, so I, um, it, there, there's one part of me that's like, oh, think of an example, and there's another part that's like, uh, why, I, I think the frame that you're putting on this like doesn't quite fit with my experience, so I'm, I'm like chewing on that in the that background. Was, but, that was fine. Just, no, no, I want to like digest this. <laughs> I want to digest this, so let me think of an example. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, in any given comedy, there's probably someone that like, makes a comment that is uncomfortable for the other people and they don't notice that it's uncomfortable for the other people or something you know oh, that's like a right. simple a simple example or or someone um mm, oh, uh, oh it hurts oh. yeah yeah or or or, or someone um <clears throat> someone uh oh i don't know there's like there's a movie i watched a while ago where like the um person uh like gets caught doing something that they didn't want to get caught doing it it's like real uncomfortable it's like oh shit like this aspect of myself like gets seen by other people and i was like not ready for that you know uh yeah. and well, you, you know you know what's something really okay quick aside like mm-hmm. I've, I've watched some movies with my kids and some of them are pretty scary mm-hmm. like monster stuff or whatever but the the stuff that they hide under the couch for and, or like cut like cover their eyes and mm. like you know it's people getting in trouble mm-hmm. like that really is like mm-hmm. for a kid that is yeah or for anyone but it's like mm-hmm. yeah that's a he- deep deep fear wow yeah i think i think being caught what I don't think, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to sit with this after this conversation. But I think when I experience this as uncomfortable, it's less like, <clears throat> oh, I'm judging the person and I think that they're bad or something. It's more okay. like, it's, it is uncomfortable for me. <clears throat> um, but it's more like, yeah, sometimes they just seem so extreme. It's like basically an experience of like, I would never be in this situation. 
I would not put myself in this situation. I would not be in this mm-hmm. situation. And it's jarring for me to be in a situation that like is extremely uncomfortable that I would never put myself into or be in. And it's like, I feel now, what, for the person. You, I really feel for right, them. And that's uncomfortable right. because it's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself in this situation. Yeah. Like what, what, like you would just avoid it, but for what reason or like what? Oh, I'm like, I mean, or you couldn't be in that situation, like physically. Not like, like couldn't, but I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know. For I mean, for example, I used to say things that were like awkward for people all of the time. I have memories of saying something like, "Oh, that was awkward. Like, why did I say that?" And everyone's uncomfortable now. <laughs> and then, like, I just don't say that kind of thing anymore. I like learned oh, how to. Oh, I see. You know, I exactly uh, right, right. I totally identify with that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, like we, we've we've done things that we've learned. Like, like I said, it's a learned thing. Like mm-hmm. you learn, you learn what people and like Martha, like she she's. I think you and her are very similar personality wise because like she she used to be like super out there and just like say say these things and or do these crazy things, and and then people would have a problem with it and she would just be crushed mm. because she just she could not believe that she, like this. Like she was just being happy and trying to, you know, make people, you know, cheer people up or like, you know, whatever, just having fun. And people would have these huge emotional, like negative reactions to her. Mm-hmm. And so she learned to basically shut that down. Mm-hmm. And I don't, yeah. And, and now she's, even, now she's, now she's not doing that as much. Like, I don't, I don't know. even, yeah, it's not, I haven't, the way I've learned it isn't so much shutting it down. It's like, in those moments so sometimes occasionally i'll say something that's like oh this is awkward or uncomfortable and like why did i say that and then i review it and Hmm. usually yeah from a parts perspective there's different parts that want different (laughs) things that weren't integrated and they're both valid and it comes out in a weird way so there's inner conflict that's being manifested in an action that's like not integrated with the situation Uh, so i do try to honor both of the parts and it's like um, yeah, I was attracted to that person and another part of me was judging myself for being attracted to them. And that came out as like awkwardly hitting on them or something, you know, uh, and then they were uncomfortable yeah. and I was uncomfortable and it's like, but it's okay <laughs> that I was attracted to them. And it's even okay to tell someone you're attracted to them. I don't have a problem with that, but like, that was not the moment to do it or the way to do it. And so I can okay. still yeah, I, that. yeah, that makes, yeah, you know? I, I see that. Yep. Yeah. So it's not, I'm not, I'm not, I really do try. No, to yeah, that, that, yeah, that's way healthier. Yeah. <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. Well, and I don't have all things figured out, but this is no, I, yeah, I'm having like an allergic reaction to either the thought that I don't. Yeah. First, the first one was like, I, when I experience cringe, I experience things as uncomfortable, but I don't judge the, I have judgments, but the thing that is cringe for me when I like watch movies or something isn't, isn't judgment. It's not hatred of these people Good. or something. No. Um, mm. And then second, yeah. Um, yeah, when I process these things, I try to integrate them in a way that's like loving to all the aspects of myself. And that's what has made the like awkward statements disappear. It's not that I'm repressing it. It's like, ah, yes, I see that you have this one part that is this way and this other part that's this way and this other part that's this way and that you're in this situation and like, let us harmonize that and say the thing that is good in this situation. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So what, what's coming to me in that is like uh, something I've learned is just is the power of knowing what I want mm, mm-hmm. and basically going into like social situations or especially social situations, like knowing what I want and basically al- already ha- having like that, that conversation between the parts, right. Mm-hmm. Of like, okay, I'm attracted to this person, but also I, I'm feeling you know this other way. And you know, I got this fear here and this thing here. And I'm basically coming to an agreement of like, okay, well, this is what we're going to mm-hmm. try to make happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I don't do that, then yeah, I, I end up saying crazy, crazy things <laughs> or just, or, or, or doing nothing, just like completely shutting down. Like right. basically my, my defense, like the freeze response, like I just freeze, right. just like go catatonic. Um, but then the situation is like in vibe camp, like I wrote out this huge list because I was feeling all this pressure, like, Oh my gosh, all these people are going to be here. I want to meet all these people. I had like 30 people I wanted to meet, mm-hmm. you know, like including you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, I should, I should probably like contact every one of them and like set up like appointments <laughs> and like, you know, I'll meet you over by this tree at 3 30 on Saturday. And I'll, I mean, just like, like, how am I going to make sure I, I take advantage of this? And, 
And so it was so good. Like I sat down for a couple hours and I wrote out everything I wanted to happen. And then in another column, I wrote out everything that if it happened, it would be cool, but I wouldn't like try to make it happen. Um, and then in the third column, I wrote out everything I didn't want to happen. And that was really interesting because some of the things I thought I wanted to happen turned out, no, like I actually wanted to avoid those. <laughs> that, that was really surprising. Interesting. And like, basically if I had had these like conflicting things going on at like while I was there, like, you know, all, with all these people, who knows what would have gone down? Like it would have been really messy. Hmm. Um, and basically every single thing that I put, like I had like probably 10, 12 different things that I wanted to do that were in my control. They all happen. Hmm. You seem like you're having a great time. I was also having a great time. So yeah, we had yeah, a great time no, together. It, we did. Right. Yeah. But remember like we, I mean, we were in the same cabin, but like mm -hmm. we, we saw each other, like we saw each other at different moments throughout the weekend. Mm -hmm. Like it just happenstance. It was just like, and that happened with most people. Like mm -hmm. most of the people I wanted to meet, I ended up meeting briefly or even for longer. Mm -hmm. um, but it happened while I was focusing on what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So like I wanted to dance. I wanted to do the fun, the ropes courses. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, what was another thing? Or to help people have fun, but that's, that's a little harder to do. But, but when, when, when do I help people have fun? Okay, this goes to the cringe thing. It's like I was dressed up like a big rooster, right? <laughs> like a, I was dressed like a chicken. Mm -hmm. Like one way I've realized you can help people have fun is by being more cringe, cringy than they are. Uh -huh. By basically going, going, like making yourself look foolish. Uh -huh. Like wow. make yourself look as foolish as like what? I mean, just stupid. And then, and be okay with it. And just, you know, whatever. And then other people are like, oh my gosh, look at, at least I'm not as dumb as that chicken over there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, not, not, not in that negative way. It's more like, like, wow, he's, he's this crazy chicken guy and, and nobody's making fun of him. Nobody, mm -hmm. like, maybe I can dance too or something. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I hope that happened. I don't know if it happened, but it's like other people have done that for me. Mm -hmm. Like other people, like even you, like you, you wear these weird kind of clothes. You have like your weird brown sash. Your hair is always messed up. Like the, the, that's, that's one thing I've, I've, I've always enjoyed about you. It's like your hair is always like super crazy. And I've always been like, oh my gosh, like how does, how does he do it? Like, mm -hmm. like, here he, like here he is walking around just like, and he's happy. People are interacting with him. People respect him. Or your, your weird little dance videos. Like you're, you're, you know, you've done like, it's it's inspiring <laughs> like i i'm grateful for that mm. and in a certain sense i said like people being foolish is probably more helpful than like someone practicing for like hours you know or years like in private and mm -hmm. then coming out fully formed as like this great musician or something right mm -hmm. it's like you look at them and you're like oh yeah well they're amazing but uh, that's not me mm. Mm. So yeah, that's what, that's what I feel like I'm doing. It's like, I am basically being foolish in public and, and kind of going through my own personal journey of like breaking through these fears and things and giving other people the opportunity to watch what happens. Hmm. So, and, and, and join in as much as they want to like, Do you have, well, first off, thanks for your kind words. <laughs> They're uh, oh, yeah. appreciated. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, gosh. Also interesting in some ways. I don't think I've cared about my hair for <laughs> many years. So it just like hearing how you describe it is interesting. Did you, did you used to? Like, was there a moment like where you actually were more self-conscious or? I, I, I had forgotten this until you started talking about it, but I did used to gel my hair in middle school and thought that was cool. Uh, <laughs> ah. And then I got a bad haircut maybe in high school that was like, they cut it just too short and I was like freaked out. And then I was like, oh wait, this isn't a big deal. It doesn't matter. And then in college, I decided <laughs> that, I don't know. I've never, I didn't like commit to this, but it's just what I've done since then for like, I don't know, however many years, 10, 12 years that um, I only shave my head. So I haven't, 
done anything other than shave my head for years. Uh, so I, I, there's you no just like, let it, yeah, you have no style or, yeah. 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 No. Uh, so I just shave it and that keeps it simple. And, and basically I don't, it's the same with my clothes. Like one, there's multiple reasons for my clothes, but one is I don't think too much about it and it's just what I wear and I have better things to think about than my hair or my clothes. So, uh, I think about those instead. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, I, I literally had not thought <laughs> that my hair was disheveled until you said that. Oh, really? Oh, uh, no. Oh, my gosh. No, it's, it's well, like, no, that makes sense. I mean, your hair looks, your hair, your hair is fine. Like, mm -hmm. I, but I think like at, at Vibe Camp, it was lo longer. Yeah, it was longer. It was when just... it gets longer, it's like, I don't know. I have a comb that I use in those situations just because it's inconvenient. Yeah, but, but like I said, like I said, like, this is me speaking. Mm -hmm. Like, this is like, what is, like, whatever I consider disheveled, uh -huh. I guarantee you the majority of people don't. Uh -huh, uh -huh. like that that's what's so crazy to me just realizing all these judgments i have uh -huh. it's not even like they're common judgments uh -huh. Uh -huh. like i mean that's what that's been humiliating too to realize like uh -huh. like all these fears i have it's like actually most people don't even care uh -huh. like so it's not even like like going outside naked or something it's like if i did that most of my neighbors would probably be upset and they would like you know they would not like it but most of the stuff i'm afraid of like it's really just it, me and maybe like two or three other people that, you know, in the world that made some comment that I overheard. And I was like, Oh, okay. I got to write that down. Mm -hmm. All right. N never go outside with, uh, you know, or, or here, here's one wearing socks with sandals. Who gives a crap? Like, I mean, that one I've, I've, you know, like <laughs> I, I remember hearing like, Oh, never wear socks with sand. And I used to do it all the time. And so like for years, like I, I never wore socks with sandals. And then I realized that, like, you know, no one even, no one's even looking <laughs> at my feet. Yeah. Nobody cares. Uh -huh. Like a couple people I read on the internet don't like it. Uh -huh. And so I, 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 I never wore socks with sandals huh. or, or, or QC or was it, how do you pronounce his name on, on Chow Twitter? Chow Chu. Yeah. He, I saw a tweet he did recently and he was like, yeah, some girl like, you know, 10 years ago told me I didn't look good in V-neck uh, t-shirts. So I stopped wearing V-necks for like 10 years. And <laughs> it was just like, exactly. Like uh -huh. one random person, <laughs> some offhand comment, and then like your behaviors change for forever. And then you're it's limited like in that way. Even if it's not about, you don't necessarily want to wear socks and sandals. It's like, there's a way you're artificially constraining the scope of possible actions for yourself. They're right. So that's a great way to put it. Yep. The scope of possible actions. And this goes back to like the beginning of our conversation. It's just like part of my journey has been realizing that scope is so much bigger than I pretend it is. Mm -hmm. It's so much bigger than I pretend. Like I try to convince myself that's small. I try to convince myself that, you know, this is the only life that I can live. Mm -hmm. And it's totally, it's bullshit. You spoke about um, cringe earlier as multiple things, but one of them was like self-hatred <clears throat> or self-loathing. And that made me curious about how you said earlier that meta in particular and self-love, the self-love challenges <clears throat> and love challenges that you did were hard. And I wonder if there's anything that you'd say about the relationship between like cringe being a kind of self-loathing and like meta and love and yeah what you would say about meta and love and kind of healing that cringe reflex and, and things like that. Okay, here, let's, I'll do a fun little exercise. One second. So basically one thing that I, uh, one thing that I've really struggled with is, is drawing or like any kind of creative act, like I'm very, very self-critical, very, um, to the point where I don't even do it anymore. So I will start drawing a picture and I will just narrate my inner thoughts to you. All right. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Can I draw too? 
Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you've you've done a lot of stuff with drawing too, haven't you? That's like, great. Might as well draw with you. How about you okay. narrate? I won't narrate. You narrate. All right, I'll I'll narrate. Um, okay, I don't even know what I'm going to draw. T tell me something to draw. A face. Okay. All right. So, oh, okay. So that that line went off the wrong way. That no, oh, that nose looks. Uh, I'm trying to draw you, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to draw okay. you. So I'm trying to do the eyebrows. Let's. Uh, so don't even know what to do. I, just, I should just start over. This is not even working out. I'm not even this looking at you. This is actually a thought you're having live. Uh, hey, hey! Don't interrupt me, man. This, this is my, this is my thought process. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. So the right, the right eye is absolutely different than the left eye i just did some really weird eyelashes oh my gosh um okay i'm drawing the mouth now i just want to stop i just want to be i, I don't want to do this anymore this is so stupid so pathetic i'm not even narrating very good This is weird. I'm not, I'm getting distracted. I'm trying to draw the eye. I, I'm so embarrassed by this. I can't believe I'm doing this. I hope Toshin doesn't ask to see what this looks like because I don't want to show it to him. He's going to think that I think he's a <laughs> ugly, hideous beast, and that I actually he, he'll either think that I can't draw at all, which would be super embarrassing, or he'll think I can draw really well and I chose to draw him in the most unflattering way possible. So there we go. That's probably probably good enough for now no it's not it's not terrible it's a i could have done so much better if i had taken more time if i had if i had studied his face more if i had learned more if i practiced more this would have been so much better and this is so so much i could do so much better than this can't believe it. i can't believe this is, this is terrible okay i'm done so here you go you see that? <laughs> that's good that's good you want to see mine here's, here's mine yeah this uh, is one of ben mosher's value it. chain things and uh it happens to be on james stuber's desk so i'm using that but yeah anyway oh nice yeah there mine, you go it uh worse than got my got my yours is good what what does it mean what does it mean for it to be bad yeah no i i what, would not have what i mean that no it, i know it's just it's fat that's what i'm saying like a, like here what does it mean what does it mean for it to be bad and who, wait wait, wait. Who so cares hold on, if it's hold bad? on. I, I had like shock hearing what you're saying because i'm aware that people have these thoughts but one there's so many of them and that these were actual thoughts that were arising for you that you were narrating yeah i've done this before like it's a little hard like doing it during this podcast is a little different but like i did it a few months ago um i can't remember if i filmed it or not but but it was it was even more like even more constant and negative mm -hmm. um but yeah no like halfway through that like i i was screaming at myself just to stop or wow. start over and just just i was i was yeah that's no I, 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 that's that's what i was that's what i was feeling huh. that's what i was thinking what would it be like for you to try to do the same thing again with me and 
<clears throat> intentionally think kind thoughts to yourself. Like the other ones can still arise, you, but you're not trying mm. to speed them. And instead you're doing yeah, basically meta, but in the same situation for yourself. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You, you want to try it? I would love to try it if you're down. Okay. All right. Uh, oh my gosh. So just draw, draw your face again and, and speak encouraging, encouraging thoughts or positive thoughts. Yeah. Loving thoughts to yourself that feel good. It could be the same one over and over again. It could be, I love you over and over again or whatever, but also it could be like, that's a great okay. drawing or not so bad. Or, good so job. should I just do it silently? No, no, please narrate it. Please. Oh, oh, oh crap. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right, Nat. There's, uh, there's, there's no, there's no way you can do this wrong. Um, what, whatever you draw, it's going to be just fine. Tashin is super chill. Cool. He's a cool dude. He's, uh, he's, he's the one that told you to do this. So the only, the only way you could fail is basically if you, uh, don't do it so <laughs> um okay yeah well, I, I see you're, you're trying to make a smile there and kind of turn into a frown but if we just why don't we just draw over that there and oh yeah there we go that's that's better that's looking good um pretty happy with that now you're doing doing good i know this is hard for you i know this is something you've always struggled with and you used to really enjoy drawing and at some point it stopped being fun and I, i'm not sure what happened but it's a pretty pretty nice nose you're doing there i like your nose and why don't we give him an ear give him a little a couple ears here i noticed that you're you're going slower this time. You're looking at him more. Um, it's interesting. It's your, it seems like you're less uh, less afraid. Less afraid, and it's cool. Ha happy for you. Good job, Nat. And, Tashin is making uh, encouraging facial expressions. <laughs> and since you're looking at him this time, you're actually uh, noticing them. You're actually noticing what he's doing and realizing he's, he's actually enjoying this experience. So doing good, Nat. You're almost done. Just let's uh, we can draw a little forehead here. Do some hair. Let's make it nice and messy. <laughs> just isn't that great? Isn't that great how Tasha just doesn't doesn't worry about his hair anymore? Like, and he's he's had all sorts of amazing experiences and all sorts of beautiful women loving him and thinking he was awesome and cool and if he can do it then you you can do it too now you can just 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 live enjoy yourself and focus on the things that you actually want to focus on all right let's give him a little a uh, little stubble a little beard here There we go. Ooh, that's good. So how's good a little? How's I a went little... even worse. It's great. It's fun. That's you. This oh, I love it. Yeah. No, Actually, I love wait, it wait. Too. Show me the. Show me the. Show me the old one. These are the two. Yeah, the second one has much more personality. It does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how was that for you? The, the meta towards yourself. It was hard. I mean, it's just, it's just it takes constant, like, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was, it was hard to, to stay in that, uh, that mindset. Mm. Um, 
but basically what it felt like i mean it was it was almost just like it certain says it, it didn't even matter what i was saying like I mean, on one hand it was good but it's like like as you as you heard my normal self-talk when i'm drawing is so negative hmm. that basically anything shutting it that that up was like <laughs> it was basically like the artist part of myself that actually enjoys drawing like actually was able to was able to just to It's like it's like a kid that's like trying to like like build with Legos, and there's some grown up standing over him with a whip, and saying like whipping like faster, faster, ah, you're not doing it right, ah. not good enough, yeah, bad, not good enough, oh, ugly, and it's like basically all the kid needs like just let just shut up or just uh-huh. like I mean, so you got, yeah, I mean, but it's like it's so that that the negative part of me is just like. It's hearing these words I'm saying. It's here. It's, it's feeling like it's being. I guess in IFS they call it the protector, right? I mean, don't mm-hmm. they talk about protectors? Mm-hmm. That basically are the the parts of us that are like trying to, or the guardians, or like trying trying to keep us from experience, like so, some sort of pain or so, something, mm-hmm. right? They're trying mm-hmm. to like, and that's, I assume that whatever that negative voice is in me, mm-hmm. is basically trying to prevent me from suffering this immense pain that i've suffered because of my like drawing like that that's, I, that's I all that i think this is the case for you but i know with that kind of thing for me especially yeah like negative self-talk in a certain way there's a way in which if i say the <sighs> thing that's hard it means someone else can't say the thing because i've said it first, <laughs> you know? exactly exactly at least it's uh, me doing it to myself as opposed to, like yeah. oh i don't know we're talking about girls like if I say I'm ugly, which I have struggled with self-image stuff, it's just not about my hair. Uh, just oh, for the record, interesting. You know, well, but if Tasha, I say girls, I'm... girls only care about your hair. Like, trust oh, me. Like, okay, that's the only thing. <laughs> the they, only thing. Uh, they apparently, care about. the only yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I don't know if I say like, oh, I'm ugly in such and such a way. Then at least yep. it's less powerful if someone that I'm actually attracted to. And interested in says that to me it's like oh there's a little uh, power there you know? uh, uh, or if i apologize for something and i'm afraid someone's gonna be angry at me and i'm like oh it was so bad that i did this thing i'm so sorry then they can't get angry at me about it because i've already apologized for it you know yeah, that's how that's... these protectors tend to work for me with this sort of thing i don't know so i wonder if that's the case yeah. with drawing i don't know no i think so i mean I, I, yeah i mean it, it's so, I mean, and I think that, that, that's such a good frame too. And that's like, uh-huh. I, I posted, I tweeted about that. Like, what are some benefits you've got, you've gained from hating yourself? And I, I, I just love that question and how it came to me because it's like, it's so important to admit that like, there actually are real benefits mm-hmm. or, or at least supposed benefits that we're getting. Some advantages, but you, even, like, they may not outweigh the disadvantages, but there are advantages. There's some <laughs> Exactly. We estimate right. that they outweigh the disadvantages. That does not mean they actually do yes. outweigh the disadvantages. Yes. And that, that's been part of my, my journey is like, is uh-huh. doing little experiments to find out if those are actually accurate. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. And so far it's been 100% the, it, it, it is much, yeah, those negative voices are worse. Uh-huh than what I've experienced huh. when, I, when I did not listen to him. So yeah, even pain. I mean, I guess that's like, once again, this goes back to like my thing about like horror. Like mm-hmm. I really believe that like that the horror, the, the worst fear is like, is basically the unknown pain or the unknown. And, uh, and it's like, even like when painful things have happened, they've always, because I've been there and I've actually, it's been in reality, like I've actually seen good things too. Or like, there's been like, 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 like you, you, you've, you've shared like, like some of the pain that you've gone through. It's like, you've, you can see the benefit, right? I mean, it's like, you can, like, there's been good things that came from it. And like when we're sitting there, like afraid of something happening, or it's like me with my drawings, it's just like, 
like whatever I'm most afraid of, if it happened, it would not be as bad as what I'm imagining because it would be real. Like Mm -hmm. it would be real. It wouldn't be like this amorphous, like horrific, you know, unknown thing. Like it would be real. Yeah, it's, it's, it was, I, I can't even describe it. It was so hard. Like, it was so surprising to see the negative self talk you had because. And, because I, well, because I keep it quiet so much. Because well, <laughs> well, well, I, well, I don't share it on Twitter. For, for multiple reasons. It's like, one, I don't experience that very often. Two, because it was you. And I like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that you, I, that this is why I connect to you because I've also struggled with many of the things that you've talked about struggling with but like i guess i didn't expect it to be so voluminous for you in this case and then third yeah third with like drawing i like have such low standards for my own art that like i don't know and 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 fourth um yeah well, there you go that's it that's the key right yeah. there the low standards yeah like the, the worst that i could possibly do is if you make two drawings i would prefer one to the other it's like oh i like this one more you know <laughs> like i like one of my drawings more you know uh in different ways i don't know i think this one is aesthetically better and this one is more expressive as you said i don't know yeah yeah yeah. it is it's very Uh, expressive it's like and it's okay it doesn't matter i could like you know you know what's funny like that that second one you did like i like the feeling that comes to me from that Uh is fear Uh like that that's the well at least like what i read in that facial expression Mm -hmm. which is is, you know relatively abstract Mm -hmm. is like is fear like i'm like oh my god for the record for anyone watching yeah anyway yeah like look, look yeah just what, it's something about like the mouth and like the the yeah. eyes and the neck too you're you're sort of you're, you're well because i'm doing oh, loomis right heads. yeah these are loomis heads. yeah and uh interesting i was trying to like look at the angle that your head is at and the angle was different so interesting anyway. okay wow yes so i mean but yeah i think i think that the low standards like they're i mean yeah i intentionally make really shitty drawings a lot of the time that's, because it's like that's it like yes, lowers the it. standards yes, line you know yes 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 <laughs> so, yes and every that's time they I, get I, up I, it's like up oh, gotta make some shitty drawings again uh right and I, I that's why i like i like i mean that's that's been a huge factor of these challenges i've done is mm-hmm. that i've never i basically made it a habit to do shitty challenges mm-hmm. or not not shitty i mean but just do these things poorly like, cause even like the first one I did, one of the biggest, one of the biggest excuses, the strongest excuses to stop me from like going, talking to a stranger was nah, come on this, you're going to go talk to a stranger and I ask for a compliment. That's not even that hard. Like the, uh, you could, it's easy. I mean, you're going to, you're going to share about, I mean, people, people are just gonna be like, whatever, that's not that hard. It's not going to. It's not going to really give you any benefit. Why don't we just sit here in the car for another half hour and come up with a real a good challenge? Let's, let's come up with a challenge that like really blows people away and really gives you some good healing. That like this voice sounds so that. persuasive. It sounds so strong and like clear. Oh, it confident. is. It, yeah. This is like my most persuasive voice. Uh-huh. My most persuasive voice, Tashin, uh-huh. is telling myself not to do things. Uh-huh. Damn. Like I am. Real good. At uh, that. I am so good at, <laughs> at telling at coming up with really. Well, and you're even better at not listening to that national. Now. I I am. Yeah. Yeah. Nice work. That's I, what I'm I've, proud I've of. made it. Yeah. Me too. Me too. But yeah, is that hilarious? Like that's like that's, that's so funny. You pointing that out. Like Nat, you sound so confident. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, and it's all it's insidious. Like, it's like confident, but it's insidious. <laughs> it's like no, do not listen to that. Sweet well, it's, 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 it, exactly yeah it's like that the the scene and i don't know when the last time you watched fellowship of the ring uh uh-huh, but, uh-huh. but when frodo is talking to boromir at the end oh yeah and he, he says like don't like he says don't even talk to me because like your words would sound like wisdom but for the wording in my heart right right and that's basically the the approach i have to that voice uh-huh. is like your words sound like wisdom i have no rational way of 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 refuting your arguments they're flawless and yet i'm still going to go do this thing it makes me wonder if you could just as an experiment <laughs> uh, um try to use that tone of voice to say the kinds of things that you say now about like push your comfort zone or like 
do what's uncomfortable for you. Oh my like, god. Does that make sense? Ugh. Like say yeah, the I same so. actual well, wisdom from that voice that's like <clears throat> confident and clear and persuasive. Oh no. Okay. Got to get it. One of the best parts of being friends with Nat is I can just dare him to do stuff and then And you know I'll say yes. Uh, well, you know, you're re- I also know you're a reasonable person and that you can have good boundaries and stuff, but like it's not outside of the yeah. possibility space to dare you to do stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And that, uh, that's another way I, I've gotten around like that voice too, is just, uh, is letting other voices come in mm-hmm. from the outside mm-hmm. and basically say, Hey, Nat, Hey, you want to try this? I'll be mm-hmm. like, Oh, well, Hey, I, I wouldn't do this, but they're, they're asking me to. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. What, what was my, like, okay. I, let, let me channel the other voice first. <clears throat> okay. Nat, I mean, come on. Like we know, we already know what's going to happen. Like, you're going to go in there. People are going to get upset at you. They're going to think you're creepy. They're probably going to call the cops on you. Like, and even if, even if it does help you to some degree, like we know what that would feel like. You'll just, you'll get a little boost. You'll get a little boost of adrenaline. You'll get a little more confident. It's not really going to change your life that much. So like, just don't, well, why don't we just don't even worry about doing it. Just, just, just stop doing it. <clears throat> okay. So Hey, sweet. Nat. So um, Oh yeah, so so so, uh, so enticing. Hey, hey, have you ever? Uh, hey, Nat, um, you seem like you're you're kind of stuck in your head a little bit. Um, why don't you go do something crazy? Like, remember the last time we did that like weird challenge, and like we uh, talked to a stranger like every every day. Wasn't that fun? Like that was like so much fun. Yeah. Like I, so, I, I know you're scared. I know you're scared, and you're 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 coming up with all sorts of reasons not to do it, and that's great. Like I, I totally understand that. But here we are talking with Tashin right now, and he just pointed out that the only reason your guys are are friends is because he, he was one of the people you reached out to. Like on that, uh, it wasn't even like you had no idea where that was going to go. What other amazing things could happen that you can't even imagine right now if you just take a little risk and do something a little crazy and share it with people doesn't that sound like fun let's go do it yeah (laughs) i love that i love that how was that for you it was hard that was really it was it was it definitely did not come as easily it did not come as easily as the other other one but once I started getting warmed up a little bit, it, uh, oh, but yo, it's scary. It's, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling like, yeah, like even, even sharing, even speaking that confidently about positive things is terrifying. Hmm. Like, I feel like I am, uh, you know what I feel like? I feel like I'm like summoning some sort of, I'm jinxing myself. I feel like I'm jinxing myself. Whoa. Whoa. Yep. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm basically pride goeth before the fall. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm saying words that I'm going to regret. I feel wow. like I'm, I'm setting myself up for failure. I'm setting myself up for humiliation and I can't, I don't even want to say what I want to happen because then the evil genie is going to, he's, he's probably going to give it to me, but he's going to twist it. He's going to twist it in a, like King Midas, right? Like everything I touch turns to gold. And so he touches his daughter and she turns to gold. What's that like? And the more of that story, what? What's that like in your body? Oh, uh, just, uh, I just want to, I, I want to just go like this uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm. Uh, and just not touch anything. Uh-huh. I just don't want to, I don't want to touch anything because even if it turns to gold, it will kill them. Uh, uh-huh. I don't I can't, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything because anything I say may could be used against me, twisted, flipped around, oh. used to, used to humiliate me used to say i told you so yeah so yeah 
Is that interesting? I mean, it's it's the. Uh, I mean, it's so it's so helpful, like actually expressing it, because it's like expressing it with you. In a in a very safe environment. I mean, I know this is going on YouTube, but but expressing it with you, it's like. It's just it's just ridiculous. Mm. You you've seen Harry Potter, right? With the, the Bogarts. Do you remember the Bogarts? Uh, Where, which basically they're 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 like this the monster that has no visible form, uh, but it just takes on whatever takes on shape. This curious form. But right. for the the person, for whatever person is looking at it, it becomes the scariest thing. Right. So some so it can be like a giant spider, or it can be a you know, Professor Snape. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's and 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 the cure to it, or the, the way to fight it, as you say, you you think of the thing you're afraid of. And then you make it ridiculous. Uh -huh. So, like the kid that was afraid of Professor Snape, imagine Professor Snape wearing his grandmother's clothes, mm. <laughs> and so suddenly he appears in a dress. Yeah. And and then you say ridiculous. Uh -huh. Huh. And there's something so profound about that. It's like, like so yeah. Here I am sharing like these like deep fears and stuff, and like as I'm sharing it, it's just like it's ridiculous. It's not even mm -hmm. it's not even that scary. It's just like. It's whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. That puts a finger on what's the, like, I, there's a like optical illusion type thing for me listening mm -hmm. to you talk about this, where it's like really, I guess it's, it's like hard for me to empathize with some of the things you're saying because I experience them as ridiculous. Like, I'm not trying to make fun of you. I believe <laughs> you that what you're saying is true. It's just so far from my experience that I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I felt fear before. Of course, I felt fear before. Of course, I've had self judgment before. But like me yep. drawing these doodles was not like a fearful experience for me. For example, is like, yeah, this is a shitty drawing. It's like not that good. I can you do know better. What? Whatever. That's normal. Yeah. But that's just, I mean, yes. It's like I my, spent my, forty my seconds mind, on this. Like it's not going to be good. Yes. You know. Yes, that's uh, normal. That's so good. there's no judgment. But I'm like, it's so it's jarring to hear you judge yep. yourself because it's like, like just. The things that you're judging, I mean, for me, I mean, definitely, I, as I say, I've judged myself, the things seem like so enticing, like, oh, I, all these built in patterns I've really built in, they're just different than yours. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think some of this yeah, is that's, like, that's why, I, yeah, yeah, please. That's why I pick drawing is because it's like, yeah, that is still an area right. that can bring up very, because I, I don't draw very much still. Whereas like, like public speaking, or like what we're doing right now. Yeah, like I am a million times more comfortable than right. I was like, you know, five years ago. Right. So, there's, yeah, there's yeah. a way in which, um, <clears throat> like, I think about this stuff in terms of practice, and like, you have practiced saying judgmental things to yourself. You have practiced, uh, you know, persuading yourself that certain things are a bad idea, and then over time, you've also practiced getting out of your discomfort, out of your comfort zone, and like, all kinds yeah. of things that are like more positive that you practice. You practice loving yourself, but then it's like how off how much practice have you put into each of these things and have you put more practice into like and of course it's gonna be uncomfortable to say loving things to yourself if you've practiced that a lot less than saying judgmental things to yourself, you know? And and over here I've practiced saying loving things like a lot, you know. So it's like that's comfortable yeah. for me. It's like it's uncomfortable to imagine saying judgmental things to myself. Like, <laughs> that is nuts, man. Like, why would you? That's poison. Why are you drinking poison? Whoa, you know? whoa, uh, like whoa. stop, <laughs> like please, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. But I think that that's one gift we give each other too, or like anyone. It's just like yeah. by sharing the things we're afraid of. Yes. It helps the other person realize. Oh, like they're not afraid of this thing or like, or, you know, it's like, I talked to maybe gray. Um, mm. uh, she, we did a space before my salon. I did a salon on like discomfort stuff. Mm -hmm. And we did a space together about the same topic a week before. And I had no idea, but apparently she was like a crippled, like introvert, like Whoa. to the point where like, she basically withdrew from her friends. She withdrew from her family and to the point like years in, like she was like sustaining in her room like not even going out and interacting with like her like college student friends or anyone like just she was like and then she went to this therapy thing where it was a bunch of people with like you know basically the same issue all like trying to like have these conversations together yeah. or like they would like take turns like like pairing up and like trying to talk it through and she said that was the worst thing because you had these two people that were super like introverted and anxious 
and trying to have a normal conversation. And both of them were failing miserably and just reinforcing like how bad both of them were and like mm-hmm. how, how it was a hard thing to like interact with other people. Mm-hmm. And she said, the best thing that happened to her was going to the, this clown class and basically learning like improv mm-hmm. and being with these people that weren't afraid of the things she was afraid of mm-hmm. and weren't struggling with this. I mean, so it's like, I think you need, you need both because it's like, like they were still, they still had a hard time like on certain things, but they were like at a level, like far beyond what she was at. Mm-hmm. So she was able to identify with them and be like, okay, they're kind of like me, mm-hmm. but they're also like totally free in this area where I am t- totally trapped. Mm-hmm. And wow. I thought that was, and that's why I feel like I, he, just hearing you talk about your hair, hearing you talk about your, you know, your self-talk, like that's all like so comforting to me mm-hmm. just being like, okay. So it really is just this art arbitrary thing I have in my mind Mm -hmm. like Mm. it's not based on any kind of external reality yes yeah that makes me think the two things I want to make explicit that are like one yeah I it's there it's not like I have all this stuff figured out I don't just different things and two things right that's what I'm saying yeah yeah and second yeah symmetrically that's part of why I have found your example so valuable (laughs) <laughs> and your friendship so valuable over the years is like there's things you've got figured out that i'm like oh man that is that is some good stuff like that's why i've done discomfort <laughs> challenges myself or you know just been inspired by your example and like yeah yeah Sp- I, I frankly i think of this as spiritual friendship you know is like um mm-hmm. regardless of the context or frame there is it's like or friendship of virtue aristotle talks about this it's like there's a kind of friendship mm. it's like he talks about there's friendships of like um utility pleasure and virtue and you can have combinations of those as well but it's like oh we could be useful we could be co-workers for example it's useful to like right. work together mm-hmm. or we could be like lovers and that would be pleasurable uh or just friends yep. that like enjoy shooting the shit together like playing video games or something and then there's this kind of friendship which is friendship of virtue where you inspire each other and help each other and give each <laughs> other feedback and like push each other forward because you care yeah. about each other and you love each other and it's like that's the good, I mean, you know, the other stuff is fine too. It's not intrinsically problematic, but like friendship of virtue yep. is where it's at. Yeah. Interesting. So anyway, thanks for being yeah, my friend. Just... I love it. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Well. Is there anything you want to talk about or say more about um, at kind of the close of this conversation? Hmm. I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm in a different place than when I'm, where I was when I started. Same. So I, I, I feel like it was not wasted time. <laughs> no, no matter if, if nobody listens to it or you know, whatever happens, it's like, I feel like I'm a slightly happier, freer person. Mm. So thank you for this opportunity. Me too. And thank you for being with me. <laughs>